Good morning, and welcome to our webinar on the Shroud of Turin. I'm Sister Marisha Weber, the Director of the Office of Consecrated Life for the Archdiocese of St. Louis. And I'm delighted to be co-hosting this inspiring presentation with Dr. Tom Sheehan, Director of the Institute of Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, which is an organization of scientists and theologians who are interested in the intersection of faith and science, as well as Dr. Mm, Lewis Guild of the Catholic Medical Association, a local guild of healthcare providers with a leading voice on applying the principles of Catholic faith to medicine. A few practicals for this webinar. First, you may come in and out anytime you wish. We ask that if you need to depart for a time, that you turn off your video. We also encourage you to add questions that you can type in in the chat room. At the bottom of your screen, there's a little icon that says chat. So click on that whenever you want to type in a question or a comment. <laughs> and they will be addressed by our presenters <laughs> at the end of their presentations. So I'm delighted to have you join us this morning. Apparently there's about 110 of us out there coming in for this mm -hmm. webinar. So let's begin. Mm -hmm. Father Nikolai, would you lead us in an opening prayer, please? Certainly, I'd be glad to. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you and bless you, Lord our God. In times past, you spoke in many varied ways through the prophets. But in this, the final age, you have spoken through your Son to reveal to all nations the riches of your grace. May we who have met to ponder the scriptures, to consider, to contemplate your mighty deeds, be filled with the knowledge of your will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and pleasing you as we should in all things, may we bear fruit in every good work. We ask this in Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Tom, um, Tom, just for a second, I'm going to um, do something real quick. Hang on. Okay, Tom, go ahead. Okay, well, um, yeah, as uh, Sister Mauricia said, uh, ITES, the Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, is a co-sponsor of this event, and it's right down our line because it brings together faith and science, and that's what ITES does. We want to bring people to an understanding that science is not the enemy of faith, but is rather a compatible and complementary path to the one truth that faith and science each pursue in a compatible way. So that's what ITES does, and that's why we're happy to be co-sponsoring this particular seminar. Now, it, to start things off uh, right away, rather than get into a, a discussion of our function, I want to introduce Father John Nikolai. He is our principal speaker this morning first, although um, after he talks, Mark Antonacci will come on, and I'll come back to introduce Mark as well. Father Nikolai currently serves as associate pastor at St. Rose Philippine Duchesne Parish in Florissant, Missouri. His prior assignments were at St. Joseph Parish in Imperial and at St. Ferdinand Parish in Florissant. Well, before entering the seminary, he studied fine arts and got an undergraduate degree of BFA from Washington University in 1999. Then his master's thesis at Kenrick Glennon Seminary was entitled, Why This Face? The Shroud of Turin and Icons of Christ. So this is where his expertise comes from and I think you'll find it quite interesting. His talk today is entitled, Not Made by Hands, a mysterious image 
in legends, liturgies, and paintings. Father Nikolai. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, it occurs to me, uh, I've been thinking about this and how I sort of got interested in it in the first place. And, and I remembered that, uh, that it goes back to one of the, one of the parishes I was assigned to live at as a seminarian. Um, some of us were sitting around one evening and that was the question that came up. The question, why, why is it that face? Um, that is, why does, why does everyone know as it were, um, that a certain, a certain picture, a certain kind of face is, or is at least supposed to be, uh, the face of Jesus. One of the things that's, that's intriguing about it is that, that scripture itself is silent on the matter. Um, and the earliest tradition uh, is, is unclear, or at least at variance. Um, so, of course, I love to talk about the, the fathers, so... You know, we look at someone like St. Justin Martyr, for example, or Clement of Alexandria, and, and they cite passages like, um, like Isaiah 52 about the suffering servant, or um, Isaiah 53, again, where it says, he had in him no stately bearing that we should look at him. Um, I noticed just a few weeks ago that, was, uh, that passage came up in the, in the divine office for the Triduum. I think it was Holy Saturday. So the, the church's liturgy links that, um, that passage directly to the passion of Christ. Um, but then again, so that's, those are the passages that, that some fathers highlight when they think of what Jesus looked like. Um, but then other people like St. Basil the Great, St. John Chrysostom, St. Augustine, they go and look at Psalm 45. You are the fairest of the children of men. Um, so again, there's these, there's these interesting different ways that the early tradition um, imagined the face of the Lord. Um, and then the earliest art record, um, it has Jesus youthful and, uh, and beardless, like, like the Greeks and Romans pictured their gods. Um, so for instance, uh, uh, you know, for instance, the, the very early paintings have, uh, have the, fig the, the figure that's supposed to be Christ looks like, uh, looks in some cases like Saul Invictus, the, uh, the unconquered sun god whose youth is renewed every day at dawn. You know, the early art record has the Lord um, in some way like the Greeks and Romans pictured their gods. Or again, there's the Good Shepherd, um, who's kind of a youthful figure often. Um, in some cases, Christ is seen dressed as a philosopher, um, sort of sometimes bearded, sometimes not. Um, and then it changes. It changes starting in the 6th century, starting in the, uh, in the 500s. And it's then that the portrait of Christ that we're familiar with begins to appear. Um, in fact, in, in the course of my, in my research, I found one art historian who said, it's as if a, a decree were issued throughout Christendom <laughs> that established the definitive face of Jesus to be used in art. And yet, as far as we know, there isn't any such decree, at least not in written form. Um, so let's look at, at what the scripture says, first of all. Um, and the three synoptic gospels are all agreed in saying that Jesus would, was buried in a sindon, um, a Greek word that signifies uh, a linen cloth after, after the crucifixion. Um, St. Matthew uses a, uses a Greek verb, anatelixin, which means wrapped, to describe what was done with the body. Um, that's the verb that St. Luke also uses. Mark uses anelason, which is another Greek word that, that has connotations of being wrapped in some way. Um, St. John's gospel uses the verb anason, which means something more like bound. Um, and John also uses the, the Greek noun, the plural noun, othonia, 
um, which we usually render in in our in our readings um, as something like burial cloths, plural. After the resurrection, there's no mention in Matthew or Mark of cloths, but St. Luke describes Peter's discovery, again, of the Othonia in the empty tomb. So there's a kind of, there's a, there's a, there's a range of, of meaning for, the, for, that, for that word, sindon. Um, it's the word that, uh, that St. Mark uses to describe what is left behind by that by that mysterious figure who flees at the arrest of Jesus. And it seems like he sort of wriggles out of his clothes and as St. Mark says, runs away naked. Um, so that, what he leaves behind is also Sindon in that, in that gospel. Um, Sindon is also the, the word for the sheet that St. Peter sees in Acts chapter 10. His vision of of a cloth that comes down out of heaven holding the clean and unclean animals. Um, we also find sindon used in ancient writings um, as a word for sailcloth. Uh, we also see it used for mummy wrappings. It's worth noting that St. John also uses, um, also mentions, if we'll, if we'll think of the, the gospels that, we've, that we happen to have been reading recently in the Easter season, St. John mentions also the head covering cloth um, in the sudarium, which we often, uh, we often see rendered into our English translation as something like napkin or, uh, or handkerchief. Um, and St. John also uses that, that word in the account about Lazarus. So remember, he's, he says Lazarus comes out bound, hand and foot, with a cloth over his face. Um, so there's also a sudarium in the case of Lazarus. And, and the verb that the, that's applied to the sudarium in Lazarus's case is paradeo, um, a Greek verb that if you can see that, that, that prefix peri, it means around. So in some sense, that cloth is wrapped around mm -hmm. the face and head of Lazarus. So to get from, to get from the, the right. times of, of the events in the gospel, Um, to get from the times in the gospel to the 500s, uh, we have to go to, uh, to the city of Edessa, which, is in, uh, which corresponds to a place called Urfa in modern-day Turkey. And Edessa is one of those places that's associated by tradition with a disciple. So we think of, we think of how tradition associates, for instance, St. Thomas with India, um, or St. John with Ephesus. Um, Edessa is linked to Jude, uh, who is also known as Thaddeus or Adai. So Edessa is significant in one way because it's, it's known to have been one of the first districts of the empire that was, that was Christianized. There is, there is in existence a history of, of the city, and it mentions a flood in the year 201. And, and the, the history specif specifically says the flood damaged the church of the Christians. So that, that suggests that not only had the faith reached Edessa by 200 or 201, but that it was, it was uh, established enough to have um, a permanent and, and publicly recognized building that, that in a sense was, was known to belong to the Christians, to be the Christians' church. So that's, that's striking, because consider that's a century before the Edict of Milan, for instance. Um, and one possibility that explains it is that there was, a, there was a miracle that took place that benefited the king of Edessa. So between the years 13 and 50, Edessa was ruled by a king, Abgar. And uh, the church historian Eusebius, who lived in the 400s, found in the Edessa archives evidence of some kind of communication um, between Christ or perhaps the apostles and Abgar. So this, um, and this, this, of course, there's some legendary material in this, in the story, but 
and there's varied versions of it. Um, but the, the broad outlines of it have the king falling ill and sending either a message or a messenger um, to this famed miracle worker Jesus he's heard about. And Jesus, in reply, offers to send Thaddeus. Or at least, and in one version, that's how it goes. In another version, Jesus presses a cloth to his face and leaves an image on it and then gives that to the king's messenger. Um, it's worth noting that this account that has Jesus pressing a cloth to his face and leaving an image uses a word, tetradiplon, a Greek word. Um, and this is the only known use of, of that word in all of Greek literature. Um, and again, it's, it's a compound. We can see tetradiplon. So it's, so tetra, it's four and diplon folded. So it means doubled in four or folded over four times or folded to make four layers or something like that. Um, and there's corroborating evidence of this story as early as the year 429, because um, it's mentioned in a letter that we have that was written to St. Augustine in that year. Um, further evidence, further facts about, uh, about Edessa. Uh, in the year 190, Clement of Alexandria lists Edessa as the burial site of Adai or Thaddeus in a kind of in a kind of list that Clement was making of where the apostles ended up and were buried. Um, so then in the year 544, that's the key here. In 544, there's a portrait of Christ discovered. Um, and one of the words that's applied to that portrait is um, a kero poetos. And that's another very rare Greek compound. Um, we see it in a few places in scripture. Um, for one place, it's, it's opposite. So there's that ah at the beginning that means not, that sort of negates the word in Greek. So it's opposite. Kero poetos is in the Greek version of uh, Isaiah chapter 2, in which he mentions the statues of idols. So Isaiah says the statues of idols are kero poetos, that is, made by human hands. So akeropoetos is not made by human hands. So one place that it appears in the New Testament is in uh, uh, the second letter to the Corinthians. It's applied to uh, the resting place of the just there. Um, another place is in uh, Mark chapter 14. In the trial of Jesus before the Sanhedrin, um, you know, there's that phrase, destroy this temple and I will raise up a new one not made by human hands. Again, the word there is a keropoietas, not made by human hands. So there's that discovery of some kind of, of mysterious image. Um, and, and the story goes, the, the sort of legend slash history of its discovery talks about a siege. The city of Odessa was under siege by a Persian army. Um, and it was a desperate situation and the, the bishop, the local bishop had some kind of dream or vision that, that guided him, um, that guided him to a room that was, that was bricked up above the city gate. So they sort of, they sort of break into this bricked up room and that's where they find that image. That's correct. Okay. I did it right now. So, uh, now right, it's mute. So, um, so, why might it have been bricked up? Why might it have disappeared at some point? Well, we do have evidence that um, that after oh, okay, after the okay, about whom, the, um, about whom the legend is is written, uh, several of his of his sons reigned after him, Abgar, Junior, as it were, um, and and a few others. So somewhere in that line of of succession, uh, we know that one of those sons of Abgar kind of reverted to paganism. So perhaps Christianity was embraced very early and then uh, fell into his favor again. Uh, in any case, there's this image that's found bricked up over the city gate. Uh, and the story goes further that, um, that there was some kind of ritual was done with the image, some kind of 
of of prayer was was prayed sort of around it or in its presence or it was it was venerated in some way and the the persian attackers siege works collapsed and uh and the city the city was saved from the siege by this by this image that, that again all we know of it in itself is that it's an image of Christ it's it's for some reason thought to be a kerapoletas not made by human hands so we go a little we go a little further in um go a little further in the history and and this the story is known um for instance we have a we have a sermon by pope stephen who was elected in the year 769 uh, that references uh, references this image, this item, and Pope Stephen says in this sermon, and in a way he is he sort of sort of imaginatively quoting Jesus. He says, "If you wish to see my human face, here is a linen on which you can see not only the features of my face, but the stature of my whole body, divinely formed." Jesus. Stephen goes on to say, stretched his whole body on a cloth white as snow, on which the glorious image of the Lord's face and the length of his whole body was so divinely transformed that it was sufficient for those who could not see the Lord bodily in the flesh to see the transfiguration made on the cloth. And this, this sermon by the Pope goes on to say, the cloth remains incorrupt in Edessa. Um, so further on in the in in uh, in the writings and the in the written record, we can see that also in the eighth century uh, was the time when Saint John of Damascus uh, lived. Uh, Saint John of Damascus, the great defender of of uh, of icons of holy images. John of Damascus mentions this. Again, this mysterious image on linen and, and uses the Greek word hymatsion, um, which is usually something, usually indicates a garment that's several, that, that includes several yards of, of material. The next significant uh, thing that, that happens is that the Byzantine emperor comes to want this, this cloth with this image for. Uh, for the royal palace at Constantinople. Um, so he sends an army to Edessa to get it uh, by bargain or battle, because by this time, uh, by this time, Edessa had fallen into the hands of an occupying force. So, um, so the, the Constantinople party makes this deal with the, with the new occupiers of Edessa and the, the the image the cloth is exchanged for um for 1200 silver coins and the release of 200 prisoners so that's in uh so then so then what happens is on august 8th in the year 944 there's a there's a liturgy celebrated to welcome and to uh to enthrone as it were this image uh, and here's the sermon that was given. Uh, here's an excerpt from a sermon that was given on the on the occasion of that liturgy. It says, "These are truly things of beauty. They contain the color of the imprint of Christ, further embellished by drops of blood that gushed from his side." So then the emperor commissioned a kind of a, a kind of official court history uh, for the cloth. And, and that history says, when he was about to appear before him, Thaddeus placed that very likeness on his own face, and so came before Abgar. So again, the, the, the legend or the story of the, of the miraculous healing of the king, who either sent a messenger or wrote to the miracle worker Jesus, involves um, either Thaddeus, Adai, Jude coming, um, or this cloth being brought, and and in this version, it it, it suggests that 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 Jude or or the messenger that that Jesus sent in some way put the put the cloth over himself, uh, sort of wore it as a kind of as a kind of costume or disguise, because of course it's a full body image, uh, and then appeared before the king, and by this intervention of this 
of this miraculous image, the king was healed of his, of his grave sickness. And that's sort of thought to be how the legend or the, the accounts indicate, and that's in some way how, how Christianity won this kind of early favor and acceptance in Edessa. Um, this, this official history also goes on to say um, that, that there is a, quote, moist secretion without coloring or painter's art made on the linen cloth. Um, we also have an account of the emperor's sons going and, and sort of a, making an official viewing of this image. Uh, and it's striking that, that, that they say in this, in this account, they say that they find the image blurry. Um, it's, uh, it's distinct at one distance and, uh, and less distinct at another distance, which again is, is kind of suggestive considering what we know of, uh, what we know of, 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 of the object we have today that's called the Shroud of Turin. There's also, there's further um, sort of interesting historical notes that involve, uh, that involve the, the, the royal palace, the, the empire, and, uh, and references to this, to this image or cloth. For instance, um, in the year 1080, there's, uh, there's known to have been a request for military aid Again, some kind of some kind of aid from from other parts of the empire for some kind of invasion, and that request mentions as sort of a sort of an additional motivation that there's this there's this great treasure in the royal palace that among other things, um, won't you send military aid to help to help guard this uh, this treasure among other among other things? Um, there's a, there's an official inventory made of the of the royal palace's possessions in 1150. Uh, and that also mentions this, this cloth with an image on it. Um, in the year 1201, there's, a, there's some kind of, of riot, some kind of unrest breaks out and a sort of angry mob forms at the palace gates. And, uh, and a deacon by the name of Nicholas Mezerites, um, goes out to sort of, sort of make peace to try to dissuade the mob. And among the things he mentions, again, is this, this, this treasure that they have in the royal palace, this, this relic. And it's worth noting that uh, Nicholas Mezerides uses the Greek word apherolepton. And that would be best translated into English as something like without an outline or outlineless. Because again, you can see the the ah that means without or not, and peri again around. So whatever this image is that that Nicholas is using to appeal to the mob, it's it's in some way has no outline. It's outlineless. Next, we come to the year twelve oh four, which is when the Fourth Crusade happens. Um, and again, we have the we have the journal of one of the uh, one of the Crusader knights uh, named Robert de Clary, and he writes of seeing something. He writes that he saw the shroud in which our Lord had been wrapped, which was stood up straight every Friday, so that the features of the Lord could be plainly seen there. And then his, uh, as we know the. The Fourth Crusade, uh, you know, wasn't, uh, wasn't an exact, an exactly, an exactly, exactly glorious. The, the journal goes on to say that after the sack of the city, um, it says nobody knew what became of this cloth. So we have this this uh, this treasure that that Constantinople had. Um, apparently, it vanishes in the year twelve oh four right around the time of the Fourth Crusade and, and the sack of the city. We jump ahead about 100 years to the year 1307, and it's then that the king of France calls for the arrest of the Templar Knights. Um, one of the things he accuses them of is idolatry, and they're specifically accused of worshiping the image of a red-bearded man. Uh, which again is is suggestive uh, if we think of 
we think of the object we're familiar with today as the Shroud of Turin. Um, you know, it's a kind of rust-colored image um, in the positive. And of course, that, that striking image that we also see a lot is actually the, the photographic negative. It's black and white, but the object itself is white with a kind of, a kind of rust or reddish discoloring on it. And on this occasion of, the, of this investigation of the Templar Knights, there's, uh, we, have, we have in existence the, a transcript of, of the trial. And part of the testimony mentions a ceremony that, that happened in the year 1287. And this testimony mentions a long linen cloth on which was impressed the figure of a man and this, this person being sort of initiated into the Templars through the ceremony is told to kiss the feet of the image three times. So again, there's all these very, uh, very suggestive things, these, these sort of tantalizing hints of something throughout the, the historical and liturgical record, some kind of mysterious image that has these unusual features of being outlineless and of being not made with hands and of having the ev no evidence of a, of a painter's art working on it. So that sort of, so f sort of down through history, that brings us to the middle of the 14th century. Um, and it's, about, it's around then that the object we know as the Shroud of Turin begins to be pretty well documented. Um, in the year 1354, um, the year 1354 is when the, is when the Bishop of Lyre in France um, is, sort of, is sort of spurred or, or provoked by, by a sort of controversy to investigate um, uh, a purported burial shroud of Christ that's being put on display by, by, um, by the de Charny family, um, which is again, an interesting, interesting that that name should come up because um, the name of one of the Templars executed in 1307 after that trial was named Geoffrey de Charny. So there's this, there's this intriguing, uh, you know, sort of chain of, of references down through the, down through the historical record um, that, that eventually ends up leading to uh, a French crusader knight and then an investigation of, of Templar knights in France that involves this mysterious image of a red bearded man, an initiation, and then again, one of the Templars who was investigated and executed um, shares a name with the family that, um, that begins displaying what we know today as the Shroud of Turin. Um, in France in the middle of the 14th century. So th that brings us to the, to the sort of artistic evidence itself or the, the, what we might call the painted record or the artistic record, because there are pictures, um, there are pictures that, that are known that, that has the reputation of being, of having been copied from the, um, from the Edessa image. And they all, they all share in common a few things. For instance, they have a, a lot of times they'll have a, a brownish um, or at least monochrome image. So it's not naturalistic, these images that are copied from the Edessa image, but they're uh, a brownish or monochrome and it's, it's always a face in frontal view so no profile, no three-quarter view, always very frontal, always very straight on. Um, and there's something else that's worth noting, uh, especially as we, as we consider, um, you know, comparing these, these very old images that have the reputation of being copied from Odessa's image to the object before us as a Shroud of Turin today. Um, they always have this, this strange landscape orientation. So, um, so that means there's, there's often a, a face in the middle and then a kind of blank space on either side. And it's, it's, you know, it looks strange on its own because you think, well, why would, um, 
why would there be this landscape orientation for a portrait? You know, I think of a, sort of the reverse of if, if it drives anyone else crazy when people shoot video portrait mode on their phone. Um, but they all have this landscape orientation, but then we think of, we think of, uh, of what we know as a shroud today, um, and we know that it has these, these basically permanent creases in it, that it seems to have been kept folded for a long time, um, and perhaps folded from top to bottom, uh, and then in half, and then in half again, to produce four double layers of cloth, um, again, doubled in four, tetradiplon, and that leaves only the face showing, and, and the cloth isn't folded across at all, ever. There aren't, any, there aren't any sort of vertical creases on the shroud. There's only these horizontal creases. So, um, so the shroud itself, according to the creases that are on it now, it looks like you would have seen, it would have been possible to see just the face and then kind of blank space on either side of it. Um, so, the, those, so there's images that look like that. There's a, um, an archway in a, in, a, in a church in Turkey from the, from the, from the 11th century that, that has that strange, strange kind of image on it. Um, again, there's a painting from the year 945 that was made to, again, commission. They made a big deal in Constantinople about this image coming to commemorate the, the Edessa cloth's arrival in Constantinople. So it shows uh, Abgar holding the cloth and again, there's a strange blank space on either side of the face in the cloth. Um, again, getting to, getting to um, comparisons with, with, with icons we can see today and with, um, with the face of the man on the shroud, there's, there's a kind of twist of the mouth uh, that's called the that's called the, the, the sardonic smile, apparently, in, um, in, pa in pathology circles. Um, because it's, it's apparently what happens with, um, well, for one, thing, for one thing, it happens with, with victims of tetanus or lockjaw. Uh, there's these spasms of pain and they contract the upper lip. Um, so again, that kind of phenomenon might explain uh, or, or at least it matches some of the, some of the more severe looking icons of Christ that are around. Um, if you can picture the, the, uh, the 11th century Pantocrator in, in the dome of, uh, of the church at Daphne in Greece, um, it's often described as a kind of severe, um, sort of severe and, and judgmental looking figure. Um, but it's possible that that that, that reflects somehow um, the sort of the sort of pain that's that's visible in the in the face of the man in the cloth, uh, if to a to keen uh, observation. Um, we think also of the of the sixth century icon um, from the from the Saint Catherine Monastery at Mount Sinai, uh, and again that, that icon has very striking features. Uh, the pupils of the face aren't at the same level. There's an arched eyebrow over the left eye. Um, and one side of the mustache kind of droops of, at a different angle from the other. Um, again, matching some of the features we see on, on the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud and, and uh, icons also share, um, in many cases, the sort of forked beard, the beard that comes to two points. Um, a straight nose and enlarged nostrils, one raised eyebrow. Many, many icons even um, replicate a line across the throat that, uh, that is actually just an irregularity in the cloth itself. They often have a kind of triangle-shaped mark on the bridge of the nose. Uh, look for that when you look at, at icons in the future. Um, they often show a beardless area below the lower lip a short tuft of hair on the forehead, and long hair parted to each side of the face. Uh, another feature that, that I think is so interesting that, 
that we see on icons beginning very early um, are the large staring eyes. Because remember, remember again that 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 that, that, that image that's that's made the Shroud of Turin so, so striking in the last century or so is the photographic negative, that black and white image that, that shows us so clearly a face and repose. So if you can picture that black and white image, um, since, it's, since it's the negative, um, the, let me see here. Right, the, what's, what's light on the cloth itself is dark on the, um, on the negative. So what's light on the cloth would look like, um, or rather what's dark on the cloth could be read as the pupils, and what's light could be read as the lights around the eyes. So that, so that say, if someone was copying an image from the cloth itself, um, it might not be recognized immediately that those eyes are, are, have closed lids, uh, as we can see so clearly in the photographic negative. So, the, so these, these, these artists, they, they saw that and they produced these, these staring wide open eyes. Um, and in a sense, it's, I mean, in a way it's, uh, as one of my art teachers said in college, it's, it's a marvel, it's a mistake, but a marvelous mistake. Uh, Cause they, they end up producing this face that's that's alert and and commanding because they they make it have these these staring wide open eyes because um, that's what they see on the positive and we, and we can and we can read as as closed eyes what they would have they would look open to those looking at the looking at the at the cloth in the positive and again remember that. Um, <clears throat> That if, for instance, some of the ancient artists were looking at, at this cloth when it was folded up for so long, so long to produce those permanent creases, they would have just seen the face. In many cases, they wouldn't have had the, the whole body to give it a kind of context. So again, they would have seen, in a sense, um, it's striking considering, considering Easter and the Easter season. They would have been looking at an image of the Lord in repose, and yet they would have seen also him alive. Um, that's why I think it's, 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 if, it's a, if it's a mistake, as it were, it's uh, a marvelous mistake, sort of a sort of providential one, as it were, that they always, looking at this image, they always painted a picture of the Lord alive and, and in command. So we have, we have all these features um, that we see uh, throughout the, the art historical record. There's, you know, they're seen in a sixth century gospel book illustration um, from Syria. They're seen in the 10th century church of Saint Angelo in Italy. Um, the eighth century Saint Pontianus church, uh, the sixth century Saint Apollinaire in Ravenna, Italy. And that's a striking one because, because Northern Italy was in the sixth century when that church was built, it was under the control of the Byzantine empire. So of course it's likely that that artists from from the from the Eastern world from the Byzantine world would have been brought in to to uh, to decorate it and and to uh, to produce it. Another striking feature of of the man in uh, in what we know as the Shroud of Turin today is that it looks like uh, his left leg is shorter than his right. Um, and what we know now, of course, is that's the result of, uh, of, of one leg being fixed over the other on the cross. Um, and, then, and then after rigor mortis set in, um, it couldn't be completely straightened. So it produces this, um, this appearance that one leg is significantly shorter than the other because of the rigor mortis. Uh, and what's so striking about that is that we know about we know something about the um, um, so what's what's striking is for inst for one thing um, some of this convention arose in Byzantine icons that shows 
Christ indeed with one leg shorter than another. Um, and in some cases, even the infant Christ is portrayed as being born with, uh, with one withered leg. And, uh, and another thing we know about, um, about, uh, about the missionaries uh, sent out from, from Constantinople. In the year 988, orthodoxy was made this sort of official religion of Russia by the, by the conversion of the Tsar. And so priests were sent out from Constantinople to sort of, sort of instruct this, this new territory in, the, in, their, in their new, the new faith of, of, of the land. Um, and we know that, that their preaching included this, this note that, that they preached Christ as lame in his right leg. And of course, what they made of that was that, um, you know, he was suffering for men's sins to that extent so that he would, uh, so that he would even take on such afflictions as being, uh, as being crippled. So that's, uh, that's again, this, this interesting thing that we know the, some of the, the missionary preachers said, and um, where did they get that idea from? Well, possibly, again, from, from some image that, that they believed in some way to, to be authoritative, to be telling a significant truth about, about Jesus. Oh, and so what this leads to is, uh, is another, um, another artistic convention that we see in, in, uh, in what's called the Russian cross. So we think of all the different kinds of, of crosses there are in Christian art. Um, and if you look up the Russian cross, you'll see that it has a second cross piece. Um, and the second cross piece lower on the cross is slanted as if to, uh, to accommodate uh, the body being nailed to the cross, having one leg shorter than the other. Again, before the year 1000, painted crosses in the Byzantine world showed, showed Christ very upright and very sort of rigidly with his head facing forward. But after around the year 1000, and again, remember that the Odessa cloth arrives in Constantinople in, 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 in 949. An artistic convention called the Byzantine Curve develops. And the Byzantine Curve, and again, I, I remember when I, when I gave this presentation at our own parish church, I turned around and looked at our crucifix above the altar, and I saw that, that, it's, um, that it's at least slightly, slightly present there. Uh, so this... this, this uh, Convention has stayed with us, I think, but the Byzantine curve shows the the figure on the cross not not rigid and straight up and down, but um, the head is tilted over the right shoulder, and the body is curved, and it produces a kind of C shape. And again, it's as if um, the executioners, when they were crucifying a man with legs of different lengths. Um, sort of pulled down the shorter one and forced the whole body into a curve. And again, we see, we see this, this Byzantine curve appear in, in church mosaics as early as 1020. Um, again, another piece of the, of the uh, artistic record we have is, uh, artistic record we have is, uh, is, uh, a prayer book that's called the the Pray Manuscript. Um, and what's striking about the Pray Manuscript is that um, it has a it has a, a scene in it of uh, of the taking down of Jesus from the cross, and the burial cloth is there in the scene, and it shows um, it has a kind of kind of zigzag pattern on the cloth or, or what's sometimes called a staircase pattern. It looks like there's these overlapping staircases drawn onto the cloth. And again, that's a strange detail, but um, we know the weaving pattern of the linen on the Shroud of Turin has, um, 
has a pattern called uh, three to one herringbone twill, which is a pattern that produces uh, a kind of a kind of staircase, uh, sort of repeated staircase pattern. The Prey manuscript, um, and then the Prey manuscript is from around is from the early 1200s, I think. It has a uh, it shows, and again, in that, in that same burial cloth in the picture, um, these mysterious three holes in a row, and then a fourth hole that's offset from them, so producing kind of an L shape. And, uh, and that those match pretty well with um, what's called the poker holes on the Shroud of Turin. Um, and again, it's not known exactly when those were made in the shroud. They're, they're before the, the 16th century fire. Um, and again, they're, they're one of the, the st most striking features on the shroud because, because again, the image itself is in some ways faint, but if you think of the pictures we often see when, when something involving the shroud is, is mentioned or publicized, what, what sort of makes an impression first? Well, first it's those patches in a lot of cases, where those where those burns from the from the 16th century fire um, were made, um, and then another thing again that, that strikes people isn't the isn't the image itself, but these holes these holes in in an L shape, um, and then we see these holes replicated, not just in the Prey manuscript, but um, but again on on pictures by Byzantine artists. Um, and in, even in, um, in the official coins of the Byzantine Empire. So that's, that's another um, really striking one because, because um, beginning in the, in the second half of the 900s, again, so the timeline here is very striking. Um, the, 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 Empire's coins often had the face of Jesus um, with, a, with a cruciform halo. So that halo that we often see in art to, to point out this is Jesus, it's, it's got a sort of a cross inscribed in the circle of the halo. After the beginning in the second half of the 900s, that space um, where the where sort of cross is the, the crossbar of the cross going to either side of the face of Jesus that space had been blank before, but starting in the second half of the 900s, these three mysterious holes, um, or at least on, on something as small as a coin, at least dots appear in that space where there was nothing there before. This is all uh, suggest, suggestive or, or worth taking notice of because, because uh, because of one of the peculiarities of Byzantine art in particular, um, it's governed by these very rigorous rules. Uh, the concern in the ancient Byzantine world in making art was, was with receiving the authoritative models and following them very closely. So, so innovation was kind of a dirty word in that context. Um, you know, we might, we might, it's, it's, it's so, it's such a, such a powerful thing to think of because it's, it's so contrast, I think, with our own experience and with, um, with what sort of the, the guiding ethos for, for Western art has been for, for, you, for a few hundred years now, which is make it new. It was just the opposite in the ancient Byzantine world. Do not make it new. You better not. Um, and in fact, we have, uh, historians have uh, the text of a ninth century rule book that was sort of a, sort of a, the rule book for, for, for Byzantine governing officials, sort of the, the subsidiaries of the empire, you know, sort of regional governors it might have been. And in this rule book, among all the other guidance for, for rulers and for governors, it lays out the possible penalties for artists who violated the principles of the, of the empire's art. 
and they would have considered they would have been considered to be in breach of contract then. Um, and this rule book specifies that they could be punished with flogging. Um, you know, they could be whipped for for breaking the rules of the empire's art, or they could be deported, so they could be kicked out again if they if they deviated from the authoritative models. So the so the existence of and the adherence to some some model for the icons of Christ that was that was believed to be in some ways singularly authoritative. You know, that if such a thing existed and was followed, that, that's entirely consistent with the with the with the Byzantine icon tradition. Again, if 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 artists were working in this tradition that that said hew very closely to to the to the authoritative model in every detail, well then it seems reasonable that they would have reproduced even seemingly insignificant details. They would have said they would have thought, well this is this is in the authoritative model, this this must be adhered to. And so they they might have reproduced things like just sort of random holes that were in that model or you know the 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 pattern of the cloth that's in that model or or things that later turn out to be um stray or incidental marks but they would have been seen as important and uh and the byzantine artists would have uh oh you know what sister um i do have uh photos um, I do have pictures of some of these things I mentioned. Um, if my uh, if my screen sharing could be enabled, um, I could show them. Okay, so um, so let's see here. Um, da, 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 there we go. Uh, so here's some of the slides. Here's play. So here's some of the words. Um, so there's the um, there's the archway in, uh, in I think that 11th century Turkish church that has the the strange um, the strange sort of landscape orientation with a face in the middle. Um, that's the that's the the Pantocrator in um, in Daphne I think that's that's called severe or um, or sort of harsh looking. Um, there's the sixth century. So, so again, so again, so again, five on from the from the Saint Catherine Monastery at Mount Sinai. So again, there's like it's uh, just look at that eye. Look at how it's. Um, I mean, it's it's sort of easily explained if if uh, if the artists are reproducing the image of a, of a man who's been struck in the face, for instance, and and has swelling. So again, that's a that's a sixth century icon. Um, there is Christ in um, in sort of reigning in glory in Ravenna. Uh, again, we see this we see the face sort of surrounded by this um, this mass of hair, um, and again, it, it shares a lot of uh, a lot of features with the face on the shroud. Um, there is the Russian cross. Uh, mentioned earlier, with not only the second cross piece, but it's uh, it's tilted up, uh, and again that convention begins to appear um, after uh, after after Orthodoxy becomes the official um, religion of Russia, and those those missionaries go out in the nine in the nine nineties, um, and there's the Byzantine curve. Uh, the head is tilted one way, the body is sort of curved in this C shape, um, again, resulting from what? Well, perhaps the executioner is of the man on the cross pulling that shorter leg down to bring it to the same level as the other. Um, this is the Prey manuscript from the, from the early 1200s. So um, you look down in the sort of bottom middle You'll see, uh, you'll see those four holes, uh, and you'll also see um, 
Okay, so I so I misspoke when I said it was a a deposition scene. Look, this is the this is the holy women coming to the tomb with uh, you can see that bottle of ointment in the hand of one of them coming to the tomb on on Sunday morning, and they see just the angel, and him they do not see. But there's those there's four holes in that L shape in the cloth there on the bottom, and again the 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 cloth has this has this staircase pattern on it, which again is something like, um, again, it's sort of big and exaggerated, it's, but it's, it's the same pattern as the weaving on the Shroud of Turin, that, that herringbone twill. Um, oh, and this is worth noting because it's, um, this is a sculpture from 200 BC uh, that's often called the Dying Gaul. And uh, you look at the, um, you can see the, the wound on the side of the figure there. Um, and that's, uh, that's apparently a, a, a wound from a strike that was, that was, it was well known that, that, uh, that Roman soldiers would do that. Because you come up against uh, an opponent um, who is likely to be holding a sword in the right hand, or a weapon of some kind in the right hand, uh, because of right hand dominance and so forth. So then that opponent would have the shield on the left hand. So the Roman, so, so the Roman soldiers would have learned this upward strike. If you could get in through your opponent's, um, opponent's right-handed side, where the, where the sword is but not the shield, you make this upward strike um, to that side. Um, and again, it's very much like, uh, for instance, the wound of, on the side of the, of the figure in the shroud that we, that we of course, often see um, replicated in, uh, in, in icons of Christ. So it's, it's as if, uh, even from this early, um, the results of, of, of being attacked by Roman soldiers was known. And, and what kind of wound would it have produced, that one? Um, that wound right, right on the side um, of the uh, of the dying Gaul. So um, let's see here. So. Um, So that's about it for um, for my part of the uh, of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Brother Nikolai. That was a, uh, a very interesting series of uh, um, shots, many of whom I certainly wasn't familiar with, and I'm glad to to learn a great deal more about it. At this time, we're going to move forward to our next talk, which is by Mark Antonacci. <coughs> Excuse me. Mark Antonacci obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree from Western Illinois University in 1971 with a major in political science and a minor in history. Graduated with distinction from John Marshall Law School in Chicago in 1977 and practices law in Missouri and Illinois. Antonacci is an author who has studied all aspects of the Shroud of Turin for over 38 years. He wrote a book, The Resurrection of the Shroud, in 2000. It was the most comprehensive book written on the Shroud until his later landmark book entitled Test the Shroud which was released in 2016. Mark's topic today is the scientific and medical aspects of the shroud. Okay, Mark, take it away. Hi, I guess I need to share the screen. Um, John, uh, uh, Father Nikolai, would you transfer the host over to Mark?
here out there. Um, oh, okay. Sebastian is. Okay, I've just claimed the host. Okay. Now, Mark, I'm going to make you host. All right, Mark, your host. You, you are right. Um, we'll, we'll be right with you here. Um, I'm, I'm just going to start while we're uh, trying to put it up, but but shrouds are, are um, obviously very long. The shroud of turn is 14 feet, three inches long. It's three and a half feet wide. It's very typical of uh, shrouds that were used in ancient times. And if you look at some of the pictures of the scenes of death in the Middle East, you'll still see them throughout. Uh, there's a picture in my 2015 book of... Uh, um, uh, some of the um, unfortunate victims of the Syrian gas attacks. And while they're transporting them to a permanent mass burial, you'll see them being transported in shrouds. Um, and, and look closely just on the news, you'll still see shrouds there. But, but the Shroud of Turin is different than all of them. Of course, it has two full-length images on it. And... The, the, uh, if you see on the, on the shroud, the top part, that's the outer part of the shroud. But look at the inner part of the shroud, the part that the man is laying on, his back and side is all uh, covered on it. And um, all this part here is the inner side of the shroud. And then what's underneath this will be the, will be the part that draped over his body, the inner side of the shroud. The inner side of the shroud on the frontal and the dorsal side is where these unprecedented images all reside. For centuries, this is what people saw on the shroud. This is a faint, fairly blur image of a man. Um, I've actually taken one that's a little bit enhanced so you could at least make out the frontal image on the right and the dorsal image on the left. Um, one of the biggest um, reactions against the shroud's authenticity is that in Europe, it's been deemed a painting since the 1300s. Um, as you can tell, there, there's just a, um, a plethora of images um, from Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, Odessa, places in Turkey and the Middle East, where the traditional image of Christ is much different and it has an image of not being made by the hand of man. And there's uh, several more full length images as well as facial images. Um, but in Europe, it gets this reputation of being a painting. And this is, is ridiculous. Um, it's based on a, on a memorandum that was sent um, to the anti-pope at the time who had jurisdiction in, in France, the Avignon Pope. Um, and it probably wasn't even sent. And in there, he mentions that a predecessor 30 years before held an investigation and a man confessed to painting the shroud uh, he doesn't give his name. He doesn't give the method. There's nothing like it in history, but that's, that's what's accepted. And, um, and it's accepted for 600 years. 500 years after that, a guy named Secondo Pia, who, who was also a lawyer, and he was an excellent amateur photographer. Secondo Pia, they were having a, an exhibition in 1898 of the shroud in Italy and it was fame, it was celebrating a famous holiday, a 50th anniversary 
of a uh, constitutional of the constitution that became um, accepted throughout Italy. And he wanted to take a picture of this, what you're seeing on the screen, so that people could be vaguely aware of the Shroud of Turin and that it's, it has a reputation as Jesus' burial cloth. That's all he wanted to do. He had no idea that when he took a picture and he went into the development room, that this would result. He, he was, it was stunning. This is the negative of Pia's original picture. I, um, and this is unheard of. The, the, when Pia saw this, he almost dropped his image. He was expecting the original image to be more blurred than that. He was expecting, hey, Ricardo, yeah. I can't go backwards. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. Pia was expecting when he developed his image, here's what you get when you take a photo. This is a photo makes no sense. It's a vague, blurry scene. You can't tell what it is. It's actually a picture of my stepchildren and their cousins in a tree. But that's the negative. When you go to the positive, that's what you see. Um, on a negative, things, when you take a picture of a person, the light that's reflecting off that person comes toward the camera. The camera, the film, in, in Pia's case, it's a glass plate. It's enclosed in a dark container, whether it's a small brownie camera or a great big tripod like Pia had in his day. But it goes in there and it forms a negative image. Pia was expecting something like this on a vague cloth itself. And when he saw the positive image, he realized, oh my gosh, the original picture is the negative. And this is the positive. And you go from, on a negative, it goes from faint. Um, when you take the resolved picture of a person that you're taking his picture, it's resolved, we see it, we recognize it. But when it makes a negative, it goes from resolved to vague. It goes from left to right. The man's left is on his right on the negative and vice versa. The light or dark on the person becomes the opposite on the negative. Pia realized this was the negative and this was the positive. And when people saw that, there's a few scientists who started saying, wait a minute. How in the world could you have painted that? How in the world could you have painted that? Now, photography, it actually starts in the middle of the 19th century, but most people don't, don't know much about it. And a lot of the public just couldn't understand the fairly simple um, photographic process where it takes the light, it makes a negative, and from the negative, you then take it to another dark chamber, the developing room, and it becomes a positive. Um, this was rejected by most people. A few scientists started investigating it, but by and large, it was rejected. And many scholars, ecclesiastics and non-ecclesiastics, rejected it and went back to the 500-year-old compounded hearsay um, investigation that was, was never made, that the shroud was, was painted and confessed. It wasn't until 1978 when a group of scientists uh, from some of the most impressive institutions in the world thoroughly examined the shroud of Turin. This was the only time the shroud has ever been comprehensively examined. Now, there's one point I want you to know. Um, when Pia took the photograph, there was an ornate frame around the shroud. 
and it hung above an altar. There was bunting on the altar. And, um, but look at all the, the change, the positiveness, the new, the new information that you can see on the positive image. All it's doing is going back to the original subject that it took, the tree, the kids. That's all um, that happens in the dark room. Um, it, the, the, um, all the detail is on the body. When Pia develops the images, the altar doesn't give more details on the negative. The bunting doesn't. The ornate frame around it doesn't. They get vague. But this image stands out. The background doesn't. You don't see nothing on the background. It's just the body image is the positive image. And the body image was the negative image. This tells you something very important that they did not even notice in that day. The source of the radiation that causes negative image is that body. It wasn't the altar. It wasn't the bunting. It wasn't the frame. It's this. In a photograph, they use light reflecting off the subject, whether it's a tree or whether it's a man or a person. The light reflects into the camera, into that hole, and it reverses it. And then in the developing room, in another dark room, it brings it back to what it was. This tells you something that they didn't even realize at the time, that the shroud is not only a negative image, the source of the, of the radiation that creates this negative image is the cloth. And, and Pia gets interrupted in his photographic process. Halfway through it, the positive develops. That's because, now Pia immediately knew this. He immediately knew this was a negative image. And, and many people just didn't understand this and the overwhelming response was, this was just a fluke. This was just a fluke. And it's very sad. People, people ignored this. People just wrote it off. In 1898, they never had the ability to put these kinds of pictures in newspapers. There was only a couple of magazines that carried them. They were very poor quality. And, and they were just a facial image. Most people blew it off and a, a stream of people came out saying, no, no, this is a painting. And, and it's, there's one other thing that gets people's reaction. And that is, there's no mention in the gospels of an image of Jesus. I'm gonna try to go to the medical information because sister told me that uh, many people here have a medical background. We have physicians and nurses and things of that nature. And, and they want me to cover it, and I will. But I want to come back to this. This is the first sign that we have that radiation is not only involved in the image, but the source of the radiation is the body, even if they didn't recognize it in 1898. And I'm going to come back to this when we're done with the medical and show you about 30 more features that only radiation can consistently cause. And they all indicate that the source of the radiation has to be that body that was wrapped in the cloth, just like we saw in the original picture right there. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to then think of hypotheses of how radiation from the body could have possibly caused those images. And that's really where the intriguing investigation has been for the last close to 40 years. Um, and I want to come back to this because that's where all the evidence is pointing to. And all I'm trying to do <clears throat> is get people to understand that there is a wealth of scientific testing that could be done on the Shroud of Turin at the molecular and the subatomic levels that would indicate, yes, 
The images were caused by radiation. The source of the radiation was that body wrapped in that cloth. And you could actually prove whether it is a, a stupendous form of radiation that wasn't even discovered until the 20th century. And it would have all kinds of ramifications, some of which I'll try to show you, but it could tell you how many of uh, the, the number of these um, subatomic particles that were released. Uh, you would have billions of items of evidence from a, a drop of blood or, or from very, very plentiful materials from the shop that could easily be tested. And I'm trying to get scientists to undertake these kinds of tests on controlled blood, controlled linen, controlled charred material, and various others I hope I have time to tell you about. But you could demonstrate with irrefutable evidence that yes, a radiating event occurred. And yes, this would easily explain the last um, reason that people are very skeptical of the shroud. And that is it was carbon dated to the Middle Ages in 1988. Um, I'll try to get there as much as I can. Um, it's, it's almost uh, covering the shroud is almost like, like uh, drinking, drinking water out of a fire hose. It's, it's very difficult to cover everything, but uh, I'll do my best. Here's a good example of the negative and the positive image. Let's start from top to bottom on the man. This was among his earliest wounds if this is Jesus. First of all, look at, just look at the expression on his face and the contours. Your immediate reaction is this is the photograph of a person. And it is very similar to the photographic process, but it is far more sophisticated than the photographic process. Keep in mind, this isn't being done on film or photographic paper. This is being encoded on linen, which is a hard subject to, to actually use um, as a source of encoding. It's not like a canvas or something like that. But you can tell just looking at that face that looks like a human face. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to consider this possibility. Um, Here's the left-right reversal. The blood marks on the man's right is, were actually on his left. This is what he looked like when he laid in the cloth, the positive image is. But uh, you see a, a triangular shape um, wound here, that's blood. Um, you also see the images on the, on the top and middle of his face and on his, of his head. Um, this is uh, on your right here. It's arterial blood. It spurts out from the wound. This is venous blood where it just slowly drips down the face. Possibly the man was wrinkling his eyebrows, which causes it to change directions. The wounds are actually on the scalp. On the back, there's about 20 wounds on the front there was about 10. Look at them. They're different rivulets. They're all in different positions, indicating the head was probably in different positions at different times. They all stop along a concave uh, curve, um, consistent with some type of a crown or circle uh, of wounds. Here too, you find the images. Here's the top of his head, but you find these wounds up near the middle of the head. There's no images on the top of the man's head, the crown, or the bottom of his feet, nor the sides. Um, but this is all consistent with something like a cap that fit over the entire head. It's different from the circlet or wreathlet type uh, imitations that you normally see in Western art. Pathologist, anatomist, Physicians since 1898 really have, have uh, with, with Pia's discovery, they could now look at the blood marks 
on the cloth, and then they could study them on on the uh, photographic negative, which from here on out, I'm going to call it what it really is. It's the positive image of the man on the shroud. But they had both to, to study it, and, and there's such an anatomical consistency and reactions. Um, I can't tell you 100% that it's a human male, but I can tell you it's, it's at least 95, probably 98% certainty. More tests and experiments would easily resolve, resolve it to, I don't know if you ever get it 100%, but you could get it, you could get it beyond DNA testing, beyond 99.4 or something like that. Um, let's talk about some of the wounds, some of the reasons people are, are uh, skeptic about, about the shroud. Many Christians have said, well, since the wounds were in the man's wrist, it can't be Jesus because there's a lot of small bones in the wrist, and it's true. Uh, and you could easily break one. And um, the Old Testament prophesies that not a bone in the, in the body of the Messiah would be broken. Um, actually, when a guy named uh, Pierre Barbet um, started doing experiments with cadavers, um, and he started putting nails in the locations where, where they appear to be on the shroud, he found there's a place called the Space of Death Dot, where the small bones here on the right um, all separate, and, and they provide a good support for the nail right in the middle. And it would hold the weight of a full, full person. Um, The, the only excavated remains of a crucifixion victim are of a man named Yeho Hanan, and his was discovered in 1968. They are from the first century. This man was crucified by the Romans. He has a nail in the wrist as well, and there's scratches between the radius and the ulna, and the archaeologist, the Israeli archaeologist, said this, this scratch is produced by the, the compression and the friction and the gliding of an object on a fresh bone. Um, well, this type of friction is actually consistent with another thing you see on the shroud, and that's streams of blood. This is the negative image. This is what you see with the naked eye, but the blood marks are on differently than the body image. So there you see them very realistically. And, um, and the man appears to have been, look at, there's about a 10% difference in the angle of the blood marks. And this, this is consistent with a man who's hanging on a cross. When you hang suspended on a cross, you can't breathe. You can't exhale. You can take air in, but you can't get rid of it. So in order to breathe, you have to pull up on your nailed wrist, and you have to push up with your nailed feet. It's very painful, and it raises the horizontal axis of your arms and your shoulders about 10 degrees. It raises you up, and you can exhale and then go back down to the position, and when you need some more air, you can push yourself and pull yourself up again. This only pro prolongs the inevitable, but this is very consistent with the streams that you see um, on the shroud. And yes, the, while the left hand is covered, the right hand, um, you can clearly see the nail is in this area um, of the wrist. Um, now, look at something else um, on here. I'll get to the fingers. Um, well, I'll go to the fingers now. These look like bones. In fact, the bones even go over the if you will, over the top of the palms and the top of his hand. There are some anatomical um, differences here, imperfections, if you will, on the body. But some of these can actually be explained by a hypothesis in which the body's not only giving off radiation, 
but the body's disappearing and the top of the cloth is collapsing by gravity. There may also be a vacuum in there, but I'll keep it straightforward. Just think in terms of gravity. The hands, I don't know if you can see, my, here you go. The hands were probably like this. If a cloth collapses down over these curved hands, when you hold the fingers out straight, when you hold the cloth out, they'll look long. But all this is showing is probably the cloth curved around the finger, the hands, the fingers on the hands, and encoded them from knuckle to finger. Well, take a cloth measure, the ones in inches from your mother or your grandmother's sewing boxes, measure a curved hand and measure a straight hand. The curved hand will make it appear longer when the cloth is stretched out. Some of the imperfections are actually interesting and indicative of a cloth collapsing. But if you notice, the fingers are long. But what I'm trying to show you is there's bones in there. And the, the radiation appears to be not only of a low energy, a very low energy, and you'll, you'll see this more, but it's from the surface of the body. When a guy's laying on his back, it's just the topmost surfaces. There's bones indicated on the back of the man, his spinal column. But both of these are on the surface of the body. And, and it appears that it, it, it all takes place in less than a second. But the, only the um, imaging radiation that's coming from the surface is getting encoded on the body. And that makes sense. If it was coming from the entire body, if this process took uh, more than a brief moment than it did, you'd have nothing but a big blur. Um, here's the feet. You almost see an imprint of the foot here, the whole foot. Um, some people think the nail is here and the ball of the foot. Some people think it was perhaps up here on the heel. But the blood's in two different positions. It, it flows from the ball of the foot down toward the toes, and then it flows um, probably from the ball of foot down to the heels. The man's in two positions. When he's on the cross, which is when, when he dies, um, the blood is running vertical from the ball of his feet down to his toes. When he's taken and put in burial or in a horizontal position, and laid on his back, the blood's going to run from the ball of his feet down to his heels. This part of blood here is, is one of the few off-image areas of blood. It looks like some type of, uh, perhaps it, it just, once the foot was there, it got bounced over, I don't know. Um, most of the blood is on the body. But they think, and this is consistent with some of the artistic uh, tradition that Father John was talking about, um, the left foot was pivoted over to the right foot and one nail went through about this position and it too would, would s provide support because the weight of the body starts coming on at this location here on the body, on the frame. And um, this is a more of a picture how um, Pia's photographic negative would look like. The man's legs are not broken. Um, here's, you can see the upraised leg on the dorsal side. It looks upraised, the knees bent. This part looks upraised and on the frontal side, see the knee is raised and it looks like that leg is still upraised from when it was rotated over and placed on the left foot, on the right foot. Um, the man's legs are not broken. The first century crucifixion victim, Yehohanan, his legs were broken. It wasn't necessary for this man. He too has a post-mortem side wound. Um, you can see the side wound on the positive image. It's the largest amount of blood on the shroud. 
Um, it oozes down. It's not propelled like a beating heart. This is probably the line where the instrument goes into the man's side. Um, it's, it's, um, it continues down his side and actually goes all the way across his back. Um, it's interrupted by some clear watery fluid. They're both, all these fluids are post-mortem. There's no swelling around the skin. Right here, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a clear area. This is serum. Uh, this is consistent with a human body um, would react to a wound. Um, if you put a instrument into between the fifth and sixth rib where it appears to have gone into the man in the shroud, it's going to pierce the right oracle. And it really doesn't matter what type of angle that instrument is. It's going to hit around there. And um, the right oracle fills with blood upon death. Um, the, the watery fluid could have come from the pleural spaces or the pericardial fluid. Um, I, I leave that up to the pathologist to try to figure out. Um, you could actually determine whether there's this type of fluid on your shroud of turn if you tested it at the molecular level. I think what's most interesting about the wounds on the shroud is the scourge marks. The, the man has been whipped or beaten. And you'll see all kinds of um, uh, they, they generally run in a pattern of two and three. They're um, small indentations. They run all over the back all over the lower back, his buttocks, his thighs, his calves, and they're even up here on his chest. The whip could whip around from the back. Um, you don't see any scourge marks on his hands or his arms. You don't see um, any on his head. This is very consistent with a man who's beaten from behind and um, his hands are either upraised or on a post or something, and all the wounds are on the torso or legs of the man. There's easily over a hundred of these. These are very, very interesting. <clears throat> when you take a photograph of the body, and then you use a photographic enlarger <clears throat> and a microscope, and you look at each one of these wounds, which they started doing in the 1930s, and uh, this continued in the 70s, um, you'll see that in each one, there's a slightly indented center and a slightly upraised um, edge. This is all consistent with what uh, an instrument, see the indented centers there and the upraised edges? This is consistent with a Roman flagrum um, they have been excavated. Um, they usually had barbells at the ends of them or maybe bones. It would rip the flesh and um, you would, but you don't see these uh, unless you look on the positive image. A and also you don't see them unless you shine ultraviolet lighting on them. And then, then you can see also the fluorescing serum around the edges. And they've also taken the serum from these edges and tested it chemically. Um, but think if a forger had to encode those and he couldn't even see any of these details. And there's over a hundred on the image. And if you get it wrong on just one, it shows this is it's inaccurate and it's a forgery and they're all right. And they couldn't see it for centuries. The same thing with the body image. You couldn't encode all that detail into those earlier negative images that, that I showed you. <clears throat> never be able to check your work. Never know if you've got it right. <clears throat> and I'll show you that these images are found on 
not only thousands, but tens of thousands of fibers that, that exist on the, on the phrase, on the outside of a thread. If your arm was a thread, the fibers would be the hairs of your arm. That's where the images are. Uh, to think that somebody painted it like this is ridiculous, and I'll get to this in a minute. Um, think about the wound on the right side. On the cloth, it's on the left side, and that's all they saw for hundreds of years was the reverse. On the left side, I'll have to go back to the original image. The wound on the man is here. This is clearly the man's left side. He wouldn't know until 1898 that this is a negative and the image is really on the right side of the man in the shroud. Here's a good example. You get left, right reversal and up, down reversal. And here it's on the man's right side. Um, how is he going to encode it so that it lines up perfectly on the right side, just a few inches from the right oracle from which blood and watery fluid would come? He only has a 50-50 chance that it's the correct side. How's he going to line it up so perfectly on the left side so that 600 years later you'll find it on the right side? There's so many things like that. A forger, he wouldn't even know these concepts, let alone encoded. But keep this process in mind. It'll come up again and again and again. Um, but the borders wouldn't be known. And this cloth could only have been so perfectly encoded there if it laid over a man's right side, even though when you held the cloth up, it would show on his left. This is a human body that encoded these images. Okay, you'll see on the, um, on here, you see some abrasions. Um, and the scourge marks are slightly different in here. It's another indication the scourge marks are on there before this. This is consistent with a heavy, rough object being carried um, by this particular individual. This is consistent with a cross beam that often executioners had to carry. This is the man's left leg. There's scratches on here. There's dirt on the man's knee. There's dirt on his feet. There's even dirt on the man's nose. All of this is consistent with a man who fell and um, <clears throat> couldn't break his fall. Now, I'm sure a forger could uh, sprinkle some uh, dirt um, on the cloth, but it would be hundreds of years before he was knew there's such a thing as uh, science who could identify the types of dirt that are in Jerusalem, um, are in the same rock shelf in which uh, Jesus was buried in from, from other kinds of dirt. But that, that could have been forged. But even that, it would take a very intelligent guy uh, to have anticipated. These blood marks, I want you to know, are all over the body. I have very conservatively estimated there's 150 blood marks on this body. But one of the things that I, there's several things I want to point out about these blood marks. The, the side wound is a good example. These blood marks line up, but they only line up on the positive image which is how the man looked when he was laying in the burial. Um, this is another indication that these are not a forgery. This is a real person. Um, 
the blood marks are completely different than the body image. They seep into the threads, whereas the body image is just on the superficial fibers, the blood seeps into there. Look at this. This is a photomicrograph of wounds. I think they're from the side wound. Um, they're magnified about two or 300 times. It very clearly shows the blood marks are still red. Now you can see just looking on the cloth that they're still red. Do you ever cut yourself shaving? I've done it hundreds of times. The blood originally comes off your chin and it's still red. But when it gets exposed to the open air and it comes outside the body, it soon starts turning dark. Blood will start turning dark within minutes, conservatively within, within hours or days. This blood, even if you accept the, the notion that the shroud was painted in the 1300s, would still be 650 years old. Blood doesn't stay red that long. Um, one of the tests we want to conduct, and we want to build upon the work of an Italian uh, physician who passed away. His name was Dr. Goldoni. He lived in Italy. And he claims that if you radiate <clears throat> coagulated blood that, that is sitting on linen, <clears throat> it will interrupt the molecular, I don't know, um, structure or something about the, the composition of the, of the blood itself at the molecular level. So that when this cloth is subsequently exposed to UV light, plain old sunshine, that those blood marks will, will, will stay red. And when you shine light on them, they become even redder. I've, I've seen this, I've stood in front of the shroud probably 35 times or more in my life. And it's usually, it, it has six feet of protective glass over, but it's usually just illuminated with with a little bit of UV light that gets to the shroud. You can see the blood marks are red and you have to stand about 15 or 20 feet away from it. You can't get any closer than that for a couple of reasons. One is uh, for safety, but number two is you can't see the body images unless you stand about 15 feet away from it. But you can clearly see the blood marks are red. And, they, and, they, and the, the documentation and description of those go, goes back centuries. Something has caused this uniquely to remain red. Now, there's been many artistic explanations tested, but they don't, those don't hold up when they're tested. But I want to test this. We want to irradiate some human blood, let it coagulate, and Barbe says all of these wounds on the body coagulated on the skin, on the body. Um, this man actually um, appears to be, his body appears to be in rigor mortis. Look at the legs here. Um, they're still holding that position with the upraised left leg over the right leg. It's, if, if rigor mortis had declined, um, Look, the feet are still pointed down from the crucifixion. They're pointed flat. His hands are, his feet was over his hands like that. His feet are pointed down. Um, for them to maintain such an awkward position is an indication that rigor mortis set in while he was in the crucifixion position. It set in soon after he died and that it was still maintained at the time of the image forming event. And, and if you put someone in a cool environment, like um, a cave, and you put him there, and he spends the rest of his time there for the next day and a half, it would maintain itself, especially if this guy um, had went through a rigorous physical exercising. And listen, all the tortures the guy underwent before his crucifixion 
and his crucifixion, that, that would easily qualify. Um, going up the back of the legs, the thighs, the buttocks, the lower back, they're all stiff and rigid. Same thing, for them to maintain that position is a sign of rigor mortis. Even up here, the, the, it's still thick on the lower, it's stiff, the lower back and the shoulders. Um, the pectoral muscles are enlarged and drawn in toward the chest. Um, he's got, um, his hands have intentionally been placed over the front of him. Um, you would have had to, um, to get the man inside the wound, you would have had to massage the shoulders of the man to get him inside and to place them where they did. Um, but notice in the process, the uh, left side is about five degrees higher than the right side. This could be due to the crucifixion or it could be just due to the way they massaged his shoulders there. The head would have rotated. It's slightly turned to the right unless it's in rigor mortis or something is blocking it. Um, it would have rotated to the head. All the blood marks <coughs> um, are not a con only consistent um, with the wounds from a body, um, but the, all the body from, from the, um, I forgot to show you one other thing about the wrist. Um, there's something funny here. There's no thumbs, the thumbs are missing. Have you ever seen Christ portrayed without thumbs? Um, if a forger's doing this, why would he do it like this? Um, you can look through easily the most popular uh, subject in all of history, at least Western art, has certainly been the crucifixion. Um, and thousands of these uh, statues and carvings and paintings still survive today. And I, I've been fortunate enough to, to look through just every one I did get my hands on it, and they're well into the hundreds. People actually collect these, and you can just go to a, somebody who's got great samples. Um, and, and you'll, you'll see a couple, I mean less than, less than a half dozen, where the wound is, might be arguably in the wrist. Usually, sometimes it's near the, near the, near, near the heel area of the hand. But, but you'll never see a picture where there's a wound in the wrist and the thumb's missing. If you hit the space of desktop, it, and you nail it in farther, and they would have had to nail it in farther because they're nailing into cross beams. And the nails they used for crucifixions were big spikes. They were seven or eight inches long. Um, so you would have had to give it several wax. And if you give it, start giving it more wax, that nail's got to go through it to hit the cross beam, but then it's going to hit the median nerve, and it's going to cause the thumbs to contract into the palms. When you set the hands over, the thumbs are missing. Um, an artist would not have painted this. I think it's, it can certainly be argued it's another unique sign of, of not only the human anatomy there, but that this is the authentic thing. And that's, that's, that's what happened. An artist wouldn't, wouldn't add that if he's trying to say this is a picture of Christ. Um, the, the blood marks... Um, they come from the wounds, they bleed down on the body, and they look on the body. They look in the cloth exactly as they would have looked on the body. When I told you that the, when you shine the scourge marks with ultraviolet lighting, um, it's serum that's been identified um, from the UV lighting and identified uh, chemically when they, when they take them from the borders and test them. There's serum around all these scourge marks with the indented centers, the upraised edges, and, and that's the majority of the features. That whole back is all scourge marks. That's the most predominant wound on the body. But all the other uh, images, most of those have scourge marks around them as well. Ricardo? Lost my uh, viewing. I've lost my image. 
I don't know if um, this really getting on uh, had anything to do with it, but I've lost. Uh, Mark, I'm still seeing the image uh, exactly of the shroud. Okay, thank you, Tom. I am too now. Uh, for a minute there, I lost it. Um, but uh, these blood marks uh, not only have uh, serum around there, the, it, these blood marks have human hemoglobin, human albumin, human whole blood serum, and human immunoglobulins, as well as human DNA, have all been found on the Shroud of Turin. I'm going to go on and talk about the blood marks a little bit more. Um, they're not only coagulated, but they all coagulate on the body. Ricardo, I can't advance my pictures. I don't know if they're advancing on, on yours, Tom, but Ricardo? Yeah. No, I'm still just looking at the main shroud picture. Yeah, I'm trying to advance it from there. Okay. There you go. Oops. These blood marks not only are, are in beyond the topmost fibers and threads, they can be seen on the backside. The blood marks are embedded in the cloth and they're, this is the inner side of the, of the shroud. This is the outer side of the shroud, and they look pretty similar. Um, the shroud marks are embedded within the thickness of the linen cloth. They're all like that. This is the back of the head. This is the side wound. This is the blood and water fluid that goes around the small of the back on the inner side. This is it on the outer side. Now keep in mind, lay on a hardwood floor and test this. But the, the small of the back would not be in contact with the cloth. If you lay on a hardwood floor, the mass of your body is going to be on, on, your, uh, on the center of your shoulders and on your buttocks. It's not going to be on the small of your back or your lower back. The blood marks still transfer onto the shroud. Now that's the same thing with the body image too, and I'll try to tell you about it. Most of the scourge marks um, transfer too onto the back. This just shows how, how well bleeding and blood marks uh, were understood in the 1350s. This is from a medical journal. Um, most of the scourge marks are transferred. They would not have been in contact with the body and, and they would have been on the top here. You see them still transferred on the top of the body. The man's arms are folded over his groin. If you lay on a floor and you put your hands in that position over the top of you, there's not going to be any contact on this top of the shoulder here. All this stuff gets transferred onto the cloth. Um, all the scourge marks on the upraised legs do as well. They sh and it wouldn't have been in contact with the cloth. And you see it on the center too. Um, they still get transferred. This process um, is a very unique process. This is what the fibers look like. This is the yellowish color that you see. And it's to be contrasted with the whiter colors. And here's the yellow colors. It's a light brown sepia color. The colors are only on the topmost superficial fibers. How you and, and they're all the same uniform color. And this is just the tip of the nose. Think how many thousands, it's probably tens of thousands of superficially, uniformly colored fibers all over the body image um, that are encoded like that. 
try to think of somebody painting that. It's, it's, it's almost ridiculous. And of course, that's the first thing Sturt um, says. It's not painted. Um, this is a very realistic view of what the shot looks like with the naked eye. Um, you have to stand within 10 or 15 feet to distinguish between the naturally yellowed background and the body image background. If you were a painter, whenever you went in there to get up close and encode these microscopically, you'd lose your vision. You couldn't tell where you were on the facial image, on the body image. You'd have to have a photo microscope, a focal microscope. They wouldn't be invented for centuries. Um, this, this mark here, it is consistent with something um, to give it such a delicate touch. It's, it's low energy radiation. Um, these fibers, when you take one and um, if you cut it in half, it's still white on the middle. It's, it's yellow coloring resides only on the outer rims um, it's uh, 0.4 microns. It barely goes into the outer surface of a fiber. Um, and when you cut it, it's still white on the inside. They don't stick or mat together. They're actually individually encoded. Um, you can't paint any of that, but, but one feature that would cover is very low sensitive radiation. It, the image consists of what's called oxidized dehydrated cellulose. And, and um, I'll give you an example of this. We used to use, um, my friends and I, 35 years ago, we would do some amateur experimentation. And we would take UV light, we'd shine it on a piece of linen, a square piece of linen. And it never mattered how long we shined the linen on uh, with, with UV radiation, you couldn't see anything when you turn the light off. Uh, then we tried something else. We shined it with a circle of light onto a square piece of cloth. When you couldn't see anything, we put it in an oven at a low temperature for a couple of hours. Then when we took it out, it's, it's, it's a rough way of artificially aging. <clears throat> When we took it out, the entire cloth had turned light brown, like this. But where you saw the image, it was darker. That's an analogy to what you have on the shroud. Radiation can cause that, but it only appears and shows up over time. Um, if the shroud was irradiated with radiation, it could leave an image like this, but you would not see it. And several scientists have calculated it. Um, you wouldn't see it for a couple of decades. That's actually consistent with Father John's um, artistic history. Um, there's no mention of an image on Jesus's burial shroud. Um, Everyone agrees he was buried in a shroud. Um, that was one of the things that perplexed me, was um, there's no image mentioned in the shroud. There would have been no image at the time. And of course, um, Jewish burial customs would have required that anything that touched a dead body, it was wrapped around a bed, dead body, they got rid of it. You destroyed it. It was contaminated. You would not have kept it around. Somebody had to keep it and, and later, maybe when it was over in Turkey or Edessa or Byzantium, they noticed this thing's got an image, let's save it. And it was hidden away. Um, but um, if somebody has a method for creating an image on a shroud that results in an image immediately, like a painting or, or other naturalistic or artistic methods, it couldn't have been 
Jesus' burial cloth because if there was an image on the shroud that was visible, you would have seen it. But not even this um, negative image would have been visible for at least a couple of decades. Then it starts getting uh, more interesting. Uh, Vignon, back at the turn of the century, after Barbet's photographs of 1898, he starts studying the shroud from 1900 to 1902 is when he begins. And he, go, he carries it on until his death in 1943. He first notices, and you can see this on both the negative image on the left and the positive image on the right, that let's start with the negative image, the darkest parts of the body image or on the re light dark reversed positive, which is how the man really looked on him, it'd be the lightest parts of his body. They correspond with the parts of the cloth that would have been touching the body. They were the parts that was closest to the body. Now, the parts that were farthest away from the body are the least encoded, but, but some of them are still encoded. If you go more than four inches away from where the cloth was draped over the body, you won't get a body image. But this shows a, a number of things. There's a correspondence between the, the dark and lightness on the cloth and the original distance that the drape was, that the cloth was when it was draped over the body. It also indicates that something, the encoding process has to go through space in some manner. Um, radiation can accomplish those things. Um, Sterk found a computer that that would show relief based upon distance if, if the intensity of the image was based upon the distance that the, the cloth or whatever your material, film or whatever it is, is from the source of the light. Um, when you put a shroud image into a computer imaging device in which the relief is based upon the distance that the encoded material was from, from the structure being imaged, it gives you a three-dimensional image on a two-dimensional surface. And it's not just on the face, it's on the entire body. Sturt went to great lengths to take volunteers. Uh, they used to get Air Force cadets um, who are, are as similar to the height and weight and physical structures of the man in the shroud on the positive image as possible. And they would measure all the distances on the shroud and their distances with the cloth draped over the body. And it was really a studied effort that went on for, for quite a while by, by an entire group. Um, and if you took a normal picture and you put it into this computer imaging device, it's going to be distorted. That's because the features, the color of the skin, the shirt color, the hair, the eyebrows, the color of the eyes, their intensity or coloration has nothing to do with their distance from the camera. So when you put a photograph in here, it's gonna be distorted. But on the shroud, the cheeks, even, even the ones where it's bruised and swelling, shows up, shows up more relief. Um, um, you find this throughout the frontal image on the shroud. Now you see it better on the face because there's, there's a, a greater variety of relief on a face in a shorter distance than on a body. But this was one of the astounding things they saw and this they discovered before they went over in 1978. This made the collection of, of STIRP scientists, it doubled overnight with this, with this kind of understanding. It's really a hard thing to explain, but the reason that, 
that the shroud has different intensity, it's not because the fibers are encoded at a greater depth, like a painter would do. There's a greater number of colored fibers laterally across an area than in depth. Whoever heard of encoding three-dimensionality in this way, but that's actually what you have. Nobody's going to be able to see that when he's trying to encoding that. He's not going to be able to wait 600 years till computer imaging devices come together and he can do that. And he can check his work. Besides, no one has done that to this day. This shows you if there's any two-dimensional directionality to the shroud. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it less scientific, but this is a part of the body image. And the round circle shows there's, there's nothing to, it's just randomly oriented. You'll see a cross in the middle. That's simply the warp and the weft of the vertical and the horizontal weave. There's no two-dimensional directionality to the shroud. The shroud, how did it get encoded? How did the imaging get encoded? There's only one dimension left in our known world of space, and that's um, the third dimension of height. The shroud's body image, they found, was encoded in a straight-up, or straight down direction from the cloth to the body. Um, and the leading image formation hypothesis says the cloth collapses. Other imaging formation hypothesis thinks that the radiation is collimated, something like a laser light. But that's what they found. It's as if every pore or hair in the body was, was giving off radiation uh, like a micro miniature laser. Tell me something other than radiation that can encode a feature like that. Um, certainly a painter can't do it. And um, um, think about just the, um, the last two things we talked about. On the shroud image, is encoded a three-dimensional correlation between the cloth and the body. And that's all found on the body image. And there's also a correlation with the vertical directionality of the encoding process. And that's encoded on the image, on the cloth. But both of these are encoded in direct correlation with the body. If it's encoded on the cloth, the source of this information can only be the body. There's only two factors in that equation, and you're looking at, at the material on the body. This is another indicator that radiation uh, could explain all the unique features on the shroud, and that the source of the radiation uh, was the body. Um, here's another quick example. See the blood marks on the shroud? On the hands, on that. Um, it's not a good image, but this is, they lit the image from the back and took the photograph from the front. Um, if the shroud was painted, you'd, all, you'd see the paint like the, like the blood marks. It, you don't see that. It's, a, it's another indication that the shroud's not painted. There was some natural uh, experiments done on the shroud. Um, there's, 
There's a lot of light scorches on the shroud. Here's some darts. This is a picture of the shroud uh, from 2002 with the patches gone. There's a series of dark scorches and light scorches all the way across the shroud. The full, this is the full length of it here. The light scorches are very similar to the shroud's body images. Um, they're encoded with a low intensity. Um, you, can, you can see through them, uh, light passes through them. They have a corroded pent, tent, uh, appearance. They have a lower tensile strength. These are all things you see on the shroud's body images. These are all consistent with low energy radiation. Um, and and uh, STIRP scientists would produce superficial scorches um, on linen and um, they would have controlled heating and artificial aging and they can produce light superficial um, images that reflect UV lighting, the same as the body image through controlled light um, forms of radiation. These, these are all consistent with some type of low energy uh, mechanism uh, accounting for the features on the shroud. Um, the, even the, the, um, the way they reflect and absorb radiation is the similar to the shroud's body images. Um, and um, uh, if you take some uh, high forms of technology, uh, if they used uh, modern, um, one guy encoded particle radiation on the cloth and found something very interesting. That body image material can't be eliminated with all types of acids and bases and oxidants and reductants. It doesn't disappear. There's, there's one they finally found called thymol, which took it off immediately. And uh, a French scientist, who's also a priest, uh, uh, Father Rinaldi, Father Rinaldo. Um, and, um, but, but, but when you encoded it with particles, uh, it immediately came off with his as well. Uh, these, these, none of them are in and of themselves definitive. But if you radiated, if you tested the cloth at the molecular and atomic level, you could, you could prove this very easily that the body images, you, you could test such things as, um, in the old days when, uh, before uh, hyperspectral imaging and multispectral imaging, uh, if any scientists are listening, uh, I apologize for the simplicity of it, but you couldn't see, you could only see things that are in the visible spectrum. But the infrared and the ultraviolet um, can now be seen at the same time with the visible spectrum. Um, you, could, you could scan the entire shroud completely undestructively and destroy scan everything about it, the water stains, the scorch marks, uh, the burn holes, um, the full length body images, the 150 or more blood marks, the serum stains. Um, in six hours, you could examine the entire thing. It could confirm unmistakably if there's any materials or particles that could have directly or indirectly caused the body images on the shroud. You could irradiate control linen with all forms of radiation um, that you could think of. And, and you could even use high energy radiation if just, just, just as a control if you want to, but you could make them all low energy forms of radiation. And yes, you could include things like particle radiation. You can irradiate linen with protons. You could radiate linen with neutrons. You could, um, I don't know if they can do it with uh, electrons or not, but I think you could get some uh, materials that have been uh, struck by lightning. Perhaps that would help. But at any rate, you could, you could even compare things like the oxidized dehydrated cellulose. You could, there, there's the, the yellow color that you see on the shroud 
Let me give you an idea how why I think it's only something very faint and delicate. The yellow body images that you see on the shroud. The reason we see them are they haven't they've not only aged and oxidized and dehydrated and developed over time. Something very refined hit the outer, very uh, outer shell, if you will, and that's too thick, but just the outer surfaces, the outer layers of the encoded fibers. These, the, the, the flax plant from which the linen is, is woven, the inner fibers of the flax plant, they're composed of cellulose, and cellulose is composed of single bonded carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Picture kids holding hands in a circle. On each side of the kid is a single bond. On each side of the molecule is a single bond. Carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, all in different single bonded um, chains. Something very delicately has just on the outer surfaces broken up those single bonded molecules and oxygen and hydrogen given a chance on their own will double bond with themselves or each other. Those double bonded molecules of oxygen and hydrogen reflect yellow in the visible spectrum. I'd like to see a painter do that. I really would, but I think I've talked to people who are familiar with, with uh, molecular microscopy, and they think they can not only identify the oxidized dehydrated cellulose, but they could identify uh, what's called the double bonded oxygen and, and hydrogen atoms. They think, uh, I think the name of that is conjugated carbonyls, and, and you could compare them with control samples but you're gonna get some really specific information. There's gonna be so much information that you could derive from the shroud. Uh, it would take six hours uh, just, just to uh, get the, to scan it, but it would take years and years for microscopists to control and sort all that information. There would be so much more information that you could acquire from this completely non-destructive act that, that regardless of what the result is, you're going to learn something uh, about this cloth. Um, I think there's a great myth throughout the world um, that the shroud is some type of forgery. Um, I don't think the shroud was any type of forgery. I don't think it was any type of natural occurrence. Um, for this to occur naturally is a greater miracle than if some type of miraculous radiating event happened to the body because a miraculous event um, consistent with the resurrection is mentioned in the most detested and uh, widely circulated documents of ancient history and modern history. You've got an event and you know when and where it is and I can't begin to go into all the evidence that describes that, that, that the Romans did the execution and they used the instruments and this happened in Jerusalem. There's a lot more evidence in this, but this happens all this under all the same circumstances as Jesus. If you tested the shroud, and this is, I don't even know where my time is. I, I, um, how much time do I have left, Tom? Mark, I think uh, you have about five minutes of the hour and a half okay. that you began with. Well, I would love to come back um, uh, through the test sponsorship or, or on my own and, and tell you about testing the shroud at the molecular and the atomic levels. Um, if you tested the shroud at the atomic level, you could prove that the, the carbon dating was incorrect and that there's an extraneous effect uh, on the cloth and it's due to radiation from that body. Um, 
you could not only prove this without a doubt, you could prove it with billions of items of radioactive atoms. I'm just beginning to, to touch the, the depth of the subject, but there would be billions of radioactive atoms in a dot of a drop of blood, and there's a conservatively 150 or more blood marks on that body. There's 14 feet of cloth on that, and, and there's a side strip that goes 13 feet down with original threads. You'd have 13 feet of probably original threads. You could test a loop or two from 13 feet of loops. Um, there's charred material kept in 42 vials um, in Turin. All you need is a couple of parts of ashes is to tell whether neutrons irradiated that cloth. You could tell easily, you would get a range of dates on that cloth that are gonna vary thousands of years, whether you're doing the linen or whether you're doing the blood marks. You could get blood marks that would conventionally date 50 to 100,000 years in the future. Now the blood wasn't carbon dated on the shroud, um, but if you took a, um, you could prove irrefutably, not only that it was irradiated with neutrons, but how many neutrons each part of the cloth received and that the source of these neutrons can only be the dead body that was wrapped in the cloth. And you would not only know the number of, of carbon-14 atoms that were added to the cloth by this neutron radiating event, you would know its real age of, the, of that sample, why it dated, why it did, and, and not only the source, but, but you could do these same events on three of the same types of materials, the, the watery fluid from the internal cavity of the mantis shroud, the blood, and the linen from the sidarium. If, if the tomb of Christ is where Jesus was buried, the last um, information I have is they think there is part of the original structure of the limestone tomb there, despite um, attempts to destroy this uh, a thousand years ago. They think one of the sidewalls is still there. Well, if it is, you would need just a tiny, seriously, I, I'm talking about something about the size of a pebble and you'd be talking about a slab that's probably the size of a, a window or a door. Um, you're not wasting material. Um, in fact, you're getting a great amount of benefit from this tiny amount of material. I'm talking about less material than the excess linen they took in 1988. I'm talking about a very, very tiny amount, but I think this will sound silly, but this is completely consistent with the Gospels. But those body images are left with tiny, could be left with tiny particles from that body, energy from that body, the tiniest amount. And, and the, all the parts of the body that you see, or even the blood, all regenerate. Hair, skin, bones, blood. Some people have a theological objection that this, this couldn't have happened to Jesus. This would be very consistent if Jesus left his body and blood on the cloth. This would be very consistent with Christian theology. Some people very, very much object to that, that they might find this. Well, this would be wonderful if you found this. Um, these things could have easily regenerated naturally in Jesus if, if that's part of the hang up or it could have been part of the resurrection. But um, six pints of blood are not on the shroud, but there's plenty of blood on the shroud that, that you could test. And I'm talking about the tiniest amount. Blood is very chemically rich, and it would show these kinds of things better than anything else, even better than body image material. So would watery fluid. And there's a lot of watery fluid on the shroud, on the sidarium, and there's a lot of limestone in the tomb of Christ. Um, we have far more to gain than to lose. Most people in the world, because of the things we talked about, because of the history of the, the Shroud's reputation in Western Europe and, and the Shroud's uh, 
not being a body image not being mentioned in the gospels and the carbon date they don't think the shroud is real anyway or they'll they'll, they'll just think it might be but it's really not something that that means a lot i i was an agnostic um when i came across the shroud um there is a lot of evidence now if the shroud turns out not to be jesus's i'm going to stay being a christian but but there's a lot of evidence that I think people could see objectively that lines up perfectly with the Gospels. And they realize, gee, this body gave off particle radiation. That's impossible in any age. And it had billions of items. I, I, I'm understating the case. All over the cloth, there would be about Oh, a trillion's not even the amount. Probably what's a quad, quad trillion is uh, all over the clock. But I'm just taking tiny little bits of samples, which show you there's billions in every little sample. You could take samples uh, from the side scene, the off image, the body image, the blood. And there's off image blood if you want to use that, or on image. Uh, all but two of the blood marks are all on image. Um, you could take even some of the limestone and the pollen, um, the charred material would tell you all these things I mentioned. Um, you could, but I'd like to go into this in great detail with you and show you this is very, very well-known science. Uh, these radioactive atoms are, are created at known rates and disappear at known rates. We could easily do control testing um, and radiate them in amounts that there's some really sophisticated technology that a guy named Robert Rucker has done. He's a, a nuclear engineer uh, in Washington, and I've, I've worked with him for about a half a dozen years now. And, and he can come very pretty close with uh, the estimated amounts of radiation coming out from every person, um, every, every location on that cloth. Uh, I would like to talk about this at a time in more detail and um, um, another hour and a half or something like that. But I hope I've given you an idea that the, that the, um, the this is, holds a, um, held a real human being. And, and this has been known by scientists really uh, since the turn of the 20th century. Um, but you could you could just positively prove that um, in every way. People try to say, well, some of the and this happens. Uh, some of the techniques that determine this was human blood and human serum uh, were done 40 years ago, and there's more refined tests now in more specific. Well, of course that's going to happen, and and I'm not against doing more updated testing, but I'm telling you that is a real human being. Uh, and it's real human blood, and it coagulated on that body and somehow got transferred. If you're interested, we can go into a whole process of how, how we think radiation is involved in the body images and the blood marks. But I did want to let you know that that is a real human being, and, and you can only cover so much in an hour and a half. But I would love to talk with you more. And, and Tom, if you know of some scientists that would be interested in supplementing our work that our foundation is um, sponsoring. Um, uh, I, would, I would just love it, would love to work with, with iTest in any way that um, you would love. Um, I, uh, I appreciate the time and uh, I, I, I'd love to talk to you more. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mark. Um, it's been a very informative and interesting presentation with a lot of uh, careful detail. We now have an opportunity for our audience to participate by asking questions. I know that several have come in through the chat room, and I'd like to turn over the uh, leadership now to Sheila Roth, who will handle those, those questions and um, uh, interact with our, uh, our viewers. Sheila, it's over to yes. you. Yes. Okay, great. Um, we have several questions about the carbon dating. So 
let's uh, entertain one that I have here from Tom, which kind of summarizes some of the questions that are in the chat room. Tom says, uh, during the 1980s, there were many scientific tests done on the shroud, which generally came out convincing until the carbon dating test of 1988, which gave a date of origin only about a thousand years ago. That discouraged a lot of scientists from making any further studies. How will the new test that you propose overcome the objection caused by the carbon dating test? Um, um, if neutrons radiate um, uh, uh, any type of object with any type of elements or chemicals in it, um, such as oxygen, um, which, which all the materials I described um, would have. It, it, would, it would create new carbon-14 atoms in the materials. Um, all the materials on the 14 feet length and three and a half feet width, including the linen, the blood, the watery fluid, the limestone, the pollens, the charred material, the sewing threads. There's seven different materials on the shroud. They would all have additional carbon-14 atoms in there. Neutrons would also create um, additional radioactive atoms that would still be on the cloth like carbon-14 atoms, and they're called calcium-41 and chlorine-36. Um, you could take any sample and you could measure the calcium or the chlorine and you'd know how many neutrons hit that cloth. That would then tell you how many additional carbon-14 atoms were added to the cloth. Um, this, uh, the carbon date, I mean, all the carbon dating scientists and, and anybody who's familiar with, with nuclear research that's really gone on almost 100 years now, um, knows one of the, the things that discovered was neutrons create radioactive atoms. That's what carbon-14 is, and that's what calcium-41 and chlorine-36 is. Um, if, you, if you irradiate any object with neutrons, you're going to make its carbon date look younger. Um, there's a lot of theories about the radiocarbon date, but only neutrons can account for a 1,200-year a difference in age. Um, I'll try to explain this. Um, carbon-14 is about one in a million of the carbon total, of the total carbon content. If you took a, a sponge and you poured uh, modern coffee into the sponge and you so saturated the sponge that, that there was nothing left of the sponge, it was just coffee somehow. It still couldn't date into the future because uh, you've got all the carbon-14 and all the carbon-12 that comes with it. The ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is going to show you it's modern. Um, the shroud would all date to the future. You're just adding radioactive carbon-14 or other radioactive atoms, you're not adding the other million carbon atoms with it. You're just adding the radioactive atoms. Your numerator is going up, but your denominator is staying the same. I'm getting too complicated here, but um, only neutrons could explain the 1,200-year difference. I think that the blood marks would date 50 to $100,000 100,000 years into the future because when you, a conventional carbon date just counts the carbon-14 atoms and compares them to carbon-12. Um, they don't, they don't pre-treat and eliminate something caused by, by radiation. The, the, the new carbon-14 atoms are created within the nuclei of the atoms that are contained in a, in a chain of molecules. You can't eliminate those with pretreatment cleaning, but you can prove that they're there. A conventional carbon-14 date assumes they've eliminated all the contamination and they're 
dating the original carbon-14 um, that's left from when the plant or organism was no longer alive. And it's generally correct. It's a, it's a valid technique, but it doesn't test for neutrons. And it's a lot more, uh, there was more, there was science to this, which, which the carbon dating labs um, just ignored. Um, they just dismissed the possibility that it could have been irradiated with neutrons. And, and they admit, they thought of it. But um, there was some inconsistencies with the data that they got, and they just ignored it. And I, I'd be happy to talk about that at length. But only neutrons could explain a 1,200-year difference. Um, typical contamination, it would, have to, it would have to account for about two-thirds or three-fourths of the weight of the sample, which, which you could tell by the naked eye if that was the case. I think only neutrons can explain it. The, all these other methods have been tested and found to be wanting. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, another thread of questions that I'm seeing, um, uh, Mona Bollinger asked, is the face cloth discussed in the Bible that was separate from the other linens, the shroud, or is it a separate cloth that was laid over the face of Jesus? And then another question tied to that was, is there a similarity in Veronica's veil and the head wrapping? Good question. Um, the napkin that is rolled uh, in its own place uh, that's mentioned in chapter 20, uh, verse 7 of John, um, could be the Sudarium of Oviato, which is in Spain. Um, that would have been removed from his face. If that was put on Jesus, that would have been removed before the images were encoded and before he was buried. It would have been a temporary thing that was placed over the face and then removed and folded on its own. Um, it might be that, the Sidari. Veronica's veil is, um, on, on the face of Jesus, you see a chin band. That would not have been the Sidarium of Oviato, but something might have been over that face to keep the mouth shut. And, and you see the gap around the face. Um, but that would not be the Sidari. I don't know. But if you want to, if you tested the Sidari along with the shroud, the Sidari may also have been in the cave uh, with the shroud. But the, the validity of the shroud would be independent of the validity of the sedarium. And the same for the um, testing of any samples from the tomb of Christ. Um, I, I hope that's not too complicated. No, no, that's good. How about Father Nikolai, do you have some input on that? Um, I don't know, I don't know a lot about it, but um, yeah, the, the relic in Spain called the sudarium, um, I believe its its history is is documented a little farther back. I think it's at least known to have existed in there since about 800. Um, and it's um, yes, it's it's uh, it doesn't have an image, but it does have blood marks on it. And uh, some of the studies have indicated that there are at least points of contact between um, between the, the blood on, on that item, the sudarium, and, and some of the marks on the shroud. So um, people have done some studies like trying to reconstruct, well, how would this cloth have gone around a head? Um, and if it was, it looks like, you know, it was in contact with wounds here, 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 and here. Um, and they don't seem to be uh, contradictory anyway. Um, I, believe, I believe it's also the same the same blood type, um, but again, so I think it's it's um, it's documented pretty far, pretty much a good deal farther back. I think to around 800. Um, no image, but but blood marks that um, 
at least plausibly align with some things on the shroud itself. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Many, oh, this is from Tom Sheehan. Many consecutive popes for the last several centuries have declined to assure the faithful of the authenticity of the shroud, yet none have banned devotion to it. What are their reasons for being so doubtful? Father, you want to handle that one? Sure, I'll go first, um, Um I think I think one thing that's important to to make clear, and, and I and I realized later I should have begun with this, was that the authenticity of of the shroud itself isn't um, isn't directly a, a matter of faith. It's not strictly part of what we call the deposit of faith. Um, so it's um, it occupies a place more like uh, things like, for instance, some of the some of the private rev some of the special revelations, um, something like uh, Our Lady of Lords, Our Lady of Fatima. Um, those are certainly well respected, and that's another kind of thing that that the last several popes have shown a lot of respect and reverence for those messages, for um, for, devo for devotions connected to them, and of course the feasts related to those revelations have come into the into the church's calendar, so that we have a, a memorial of Our Lady of Lords, Our Lady of Guadalupe, things like that. Um, but they're not; they don't occupy quite the same place that um, that the absolute sort of kernel truths of the faith, Scripture, and and capital T tradition would be in, so that I would, again, I, I don't want to mind read uh, popes too much, but, um, but, but those kinds of things are usually, um, you know, often promoted by, by sort of magisterial authority um, to the extent that they will uh, assist the, the devotion and and zeal of the faithful, um, but they're not, um, they're not a sort of a thing that, that one's required to give the same kind of assent to as, say, the resurrection itself, um, or the incarnation, or the trinity, or those sorts of things. The, the, a shroud, or, or in fact any relic, um, you know, occupies, occupies the place like, like the place of any sacramental, of any holy image, you know, it's 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 found by the by the competent authority not to do anything contrary to the faith but to be a possible aid to it so that this image for instance um is offered for us to to look upon and meditate and it's meant of course to to draw us into the lord's passion um to be a kind of concrete thing because we're we're embodied souls, we're spirit and flesh, so we need concrete things to sort of fix our attention upon um, and, and, and to ponder and to look at. And hopefully, hopefully that process uh, assists our faith, um, but it's not, it's not, strictly speaking, an absolutely necessary part of it. Very good, very good. Thank you. Mark, do you have something to add to that? Um. If Christ left his body and blood on his burial cloth with all of these amazing properties, um, we should look at it. We've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. It doesn't affect the tenets of Christianity. They're all based on the Gospels. But if these um, findings confirmed every element of the passion, crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, boy, that's something everybody needs to know about. We are all going to die. And these are the events, the very events, that can give us an undeserved life after death. And if it can be demonstrated um that that's that would be wonderful that 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 um that that uh, well i can't think of an adjective that that's uh 
it, that would not be an understatement. Well, why not? Why not look on it? Uh, the evidence is pointing that way, and um, <laughs> um, the evidence is actually overwhelming. Um, from what I can see, if you had um, hundreds or thousands of items of evidence indicating one thing and one indicating not, um, you wouldn't just go on the one and throw everything else out. But that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. But you could test this. Now, and when I talk about testing the shroud, uh, you know, for radiation, that's just one of the things. We can still test for every artistic and naturalistic method you come, can come up with. I'm not against that one bit. There's, there's a popular uh, invisible reweave uh, theory going on that explains the, sh the, uh, the shrouds uh, carbon dating uh, to the Middle Ages. I, I think that's kind of silly. But let's test it. Maybe it really is. Maybe I'm the one that's silly. But let's test it and see. Um, we're just, in 1978, the shroud was, was, it was only examined one time. And think of all the thousands of items of evidence we've acquired, and we've only comprehensively examined it one time. Why not test it again? Um, it, <laughs> uh, I, I, can't, I can't think of a thing we had to lose, but oh boy, we have uh, a lot to gain. Um, um. Agreed, thank you. Yes, there's um, a lot to gain from that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. If any scientists are listening and want to and wanna bring the science up so that it can be demonstrated on control materials, then and only then would I want to ask the popes to consider testing this from the shroud. I, I don't want them to leap I don't want to leap to the shroud right now. I want to demonstrate and perfect this testing on control samples, all the control samples. It's not fair to anybody to do it any other way, and I wouldn't dream of it. But it can be developed and demonstrated on control samples. Sure. Um, keeping up with uh, some testing and some evidence, uh, Tom Sheehan also had another question. He says, supposedly pollen was found on the shroud that could only come from plants that were typical of Jerusalem. Pollen is pretty small and pretty widespread. Could such a measurement be that precise? The, um, it's, it's debatable. Um, um, Dr. Fry um, has done the main testing of these samples and uh, a priest named uh, Werner Balz, um has done most of the analysis of them. Um, Evan Amdanin and another Israeli pollen expert um, um, also got to look at these samples. And um, many people think that, like uh, Tom asked, can you be that precise? Um, many of the samples um, Fry had to find himself uh, with some original research. There wasn't all the data on Middle Eastern pollens as there are now, but he kind of began the, the pioneering uh, study in that area. Um, I don't know, I think it needs more testing. Um, yeah. The only way, one of the ways that as possibility is that if they say a vast majority of them came from uh, Israel and uh, if that's so, it could only be explained by one thing, I think, and that would be in ancient times uh, when linen was, was made, they would cut the flax plant and soak it in water. It's called a redding process. And, and uh, they would take it in water, they would take it out, they'd beat it on a rock and set it in the field, and then they'd let it dry, and then they'd put it back in the water, and then they'd take it out and comb it. It was a whole process. But when you set it in the water, pollen's going to fall in the water, and it's going to fall in the field. So if you keep doing that process, it might have picked up all these microscopic pollen into the into the the uh, stalks of the linen that they're going to make the weave out of, and that it that could have possibly explained why such a large majority of it 
occurred there. Uh, this pollen material, this pollens that were on sticky tape, they've been on sticky tape now since the 70s, and it's hard to examine them. One of the benefits of examining the shroud, taking the backing cloth off and looking at it on both sides, you keep in mind the outer side um, would have laid on the limestone. Um, it would pick up a lot more dirt and pine limestone and that kind of stuff and um, and perhaps pollen and um, trying to shut the darn phone off pick it up and um, uh, and possibly through the reading process it might explain it uh, some of the limestone things like that you could get it out you don't have to have the sticky tape that prevents you from seeing it. You can rotate the sample and everything like that. Plus, uh, uh, examine it right there in situ in the cloth and, and maybe tell, they get a better definition of where, what kind of pollen this is and where it's at. And the photos at any rate and the feedback would give a much better identification than in the old days when they had to use just the pollen that they saw on a sticky tape and compare it to a drawing or a picture in a book. Okay, great. Um, early on during Father Nikolai's talk, uh, Russ Briel, Briel asked a question, Eusebius doesn't mention an image that comes later in the fifth century. Why do you think there is no mention of it in his writings? Also, other historians believe it traveled through Antioch and arrived in Edessa in 544. Why do you prefer the Edessa version? Hey, Russ, uh, uh, there, there's different versions. Um, um, and, and no one knows at this point, which is true. Uh, the, the image of Christ, the traditional image of Christ starts in the sixth century and um, that image could have went from Jerusalem to Antioch or to Odessa or both. Um, we really don't know. And um, uh, I don't have a, a preference one way or the other. And I'll leave that up to Father uh, Nikolai and the rest of them to, to feed in the details. Um, I would say I don't know that I have a especially strong preference necessarily for Odessa. I'm, I'm honestly not aware of the of the Antioch theory. And this is, I think, if, um, to be honest, this is one of the, the places where uh, it's, it's difficult to sort of reconstruct that itinerary of, of this item if it's the same thing, because it does get sort of kind of garbled and there are these different versions of stories and there is, you know, some, most of the sources I read said, you know, there is some legendary material mixed up in it. Um, I think I think it's I think it's at least suggestive though. Um, that's what that's what always sort of delighted me once I started looking into the into the history. There are all these these hints, these sort of tantalizing mentions that that might all be about the same thing or might not. Um, I think one 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 of my sources, one of the authors I read, pointed out that um, you know what what happens in throughout history with 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 legends that arise about something it's not so much it's not so often the case that someone says let me fake up something and also fake up the story that goes with it but um a lot of times a legend arises to explain the presence of something that already exists so um if the actual history of what happened between Jesus and Jude Thaddeus Adai and Abgar or possibly a, a later Abgar, if, if, that, if that all got garbled or, um, or isn't, um, you know, we can't really understand what exactly happened. Um, uh, I think the more important thing is that that, that story or those, those various stories account for the existence of, of something that, that seems to have been there. Um, that's the best I can say. Honestly, not knowing a lot about the the, the involvement of Antioch or or um, 
or even directly myself, what Eusebius said. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question from Neil Veneman. He said, what do you think St. John, quote, saw and believed, unquote? Is there evidence that John saw the face of Jesus imprinted on the headcloth as the rest of his body was imprinted on the shroud? There's no image on the body image uh, or face image on the sidarium. Okay. Um, that would have been set off to the side, um, but only the part of the shroud that wrapped over the body would have a body image. Um, I, I, I think he sees the cloth collapsed um, onto, and um, I, I don't think anyone sees an image on the shroud or the bear, or Jesus' burial shroud because there was none at the time. And, and if there was one, they would have mentioned it. One of the... Um... One of the things worth keeping in mind about, about that verse um, is what follows immediately after it, which says they did not, it's either translated, they did not know or did not understand that he had to rise from the dead. So when I wanted to know more about that verse, um, and, I, and I looked at it again recently, I, I went to the Fathers, of course, which is a good place to start, and people like, um, I think St. Augustine at least, um, and possibly others say, uh, and this might be disappointing, but <laughs> Augustine says, and it's, it's, it is a, a, an ambiguous phrase, but Augustine says um, he believed what the woman had told him. Uh, so Augustine thinks when it says he believed, that means he believed what he had just heard, which is um, they've taken away the Lord and we don't know where he is. Um, so, um, and I don't know, I don't know much about the subsequent um, um, scriptural studies that might have uh, figured out exactly what the what the meaning of of believed in that case um, meant, but Augustine and at least some of the other early authorities say um, because of that following line, they didn't know he had to rise from the dead. It just means he accepted the testimony of uh, of the woman. Um, he'd encountered right outside the tomb, or, or the woman who came and told them and then they ran to see it. That's yeah. another possibility okay. anyway for, uh, for that phrase. Sure. Magdalene saw him first. Okay, we have a question from Paul Segura. He says, I've heard that the 1978 tests were from a sample from the patches from the fire repair, not the shroud itself. Um, he says, what are the leading theories about the four holes? He's referring to some, um, there's some poker holes on the shroud that um, Father Nikolai mentioned the um, Hungarian prey manuscript. Um, they're kind of in a, a shape of a seven. Uh, see if I can, I, I guess my images are gone, but on my screen, they're still here. I can, um, hang on, I can uh, transfer host over to you. Hang on. Okay, Mark, now you can share your screen. Okay. Um, there's some holes here and here. You might uh, have some here. We don't know if they're all connected or not, but... They think one of the, in ancient times that, uh, but this pattern here is visible on the Hungarian prey manuscript, among other similarities. Um, the thumbs are missing on the Hungarian prey manuscript. Uh, he's in the same type of posture. Um, and it, it looks like they're trying to highlight the weave that is, is somewhat like the three to one herringbone twill that uh, Father John mentioned as well. And, um, so the Hungarian Prey Manuscript, which goes back to, I think, 1190, uh, which is prior to the carbon date, um, and these poker holes, I think he, the, the questioner is asking, um, doesn't this indicate the shroud's presence um, even prior to the 1260 to 1390 uh, estimated carbon date by the radiocarbon labs? And um, yes, it does. 
I think that's what the question addresses itself to. I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. Also about Mark about the possibility that that what ended up being tested was a patched part. That theory is that still current or? I think he's talking about the invisible reweave that somehow there's an invisible patch uh, on the shroud that uh, was dated along with the original cloth, and so it, and about a third of it roughly is is the patch. So you get uh, two um, 16th century or one 16th century patch with a first century cloth and the mix is 1260 to 1390, something like that. I, um, to the extent this has been tested with uh, x-rays and um, uh, microscopic testing of the area and um, x-ray fluorescence and um, other types of imaging, there's nothing to indicate an invisible reweave. It's it's all a hypothesis, but you could test it. If you examine the shroud at the molecular level, you could easily examine it, especially if you tested both sides of the cloth. Uh, since that their hypothesis came out, they've examined the back side and the front side, um, and there's no evidence of, of a patch, uh, of, of a, of a uh, seemingly invisible reweave. Um, and that's, that's with a number of people uh, looking at both sides of it. But I'm all for testing this and looking at it at the molecular level. Maybe it's true. Let's test it. And speaking of testing, uh, Tom asked the question, why are the current keepers or owners of the shroud so opposed to allowing further testing with the most modern and accurate instruments? I, I, I hopefully I think that's hopefully that's a little strong, and the question of examining the shroud at the molecular and atomic levels is a little premature. I like to think that if they saw how this these technologies are perfected in a, with a variety of control samples. And I'm talking about testing at the molecular and atomic level with all seven types of samples to the most extent that you can. I think then and only then when they look at the results, then it's time to consider the question. So they really haven't rejected it because we haven't developed the technology that could be developed. And if any scientists are out there listening and would like to take part in this, or if any um, just uh, interested people who are out there who would like to help fund this because this will cost money. We'll have to pay laboratories and scientists to, to do the work. Uh, even if they're generous with their time, it's still going to cost money. So if you would like to help develop these technologies, please. Um, my website is, uh, uh, is on the screen. It's uh, testtheshroud.org. Um, and uh, our email address is testtheshroud at gmail.com. Um, we'd be happy to work with you in any way possible. Great, great. Uh, we just got a question from Thomas. He said, Mark said human DNA was found on the cloth. What does that tell us other than the obvious fact that it was a man? It also indicated it was ancient blood, but newer techniques um, have been devised. Uh, I think that DNA test was done in the 1990s uh, at the University of uh, Texas in San Antonio. Um, more specific testing can be done with a sample. However, the shroud itself has been handled and touched and kissed um, for centuries, people have laid their paintings on them. It's, 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 um, you, you actually have female DNA on the shroud, and it's very understandable. In 1534, the poor Claire nuns put 16 patches on the shroud. Um, and and the, the, the textile expert uh, who headed the examination in uh, 2000, was uh, uh, Madame Fleury Lambert. 
and 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 she and other women could easily have have put their DNA on him because you have to smooth the shot out and and fill its texture. That gosh knows what type of, but it's going to be hard to sequence to to just. It's going to be hard to segregate. Uh, I think they want about a dozen samples of, of only one person's DNA samples. Um, I, I don't think you were going to really do that, but um, I, I think it's it's not very practical right now to try to take 12 samples uh, just to get an identification, uh, a pure identification. That that's that to me would be way, way too many samples. And it's all it's gonna say is that it's human blood. It's not gonna be able to say, this is Jesus's, that we have, we can match it to Jesus's DNA. But I would like a, a more interesting example is, is let's compare the blood from the starium with the shroud and see if it's the same. Um, that would be interesting. Um, have there been any tests on that, the, comparing the blood on the sedarium with the blood on the shroud? Uh, um, we're proposing that in our examinations. Uh, you could uh, see if there's a match at the molecular level and then um, see what that looks like. That's going to be uh, pretty good. And you can also examine the serum and the internal uh, body fluid. And, and that might all line up to the same person. I don't know. This is new technology being applied to um, a, a couple of relics for the first time. We don't know what we're going to find. But um, and, and then you might want to try to do a DNA of those two samples. But why take 12 samples when you already have two and you could do some prelim preliminary analysis before that? Okay. Father Nikolai, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I, okay. I, that's um, nope, nope. Okay, I have another question from Tom Sheehan. He says the narrative about the recovery of the shroud has brought it to Western Europe by a crusader. How could such a special object be transported without attracting attention? Oh, good question. I mean. Um, if, if say you had stolen a relic in 13th century Europe, you might do your best to, uh, stuff it way down deep in your baggage and, uh, <laughs> and not let anyone know you had it. That's the only, that's the only theory that I've encountered about that though. It would have been like taken in the, in the frenzy of the sack of a, of a city under siege and then, uh, and then, uh, and then hidden because of possible repercussions to the person who turned out to have taken it. <laughs> the, the, the Knights Templars were a very secretive group. Yeah. And, and they might have, um, and, and they financed the crusade um, or were big financers uh, of the crusade. Um, they might have, but though, though a lot of the latest um, historical thinking is that it just stayed in Constantinople and the, the, the Byzantine Empire was never the same after the sack of, of 1204. It was never the same. It just was just withering and held together, propped up with, um, funded by the, by the very countries that led the crusade, but it finally just was sent over because they were so far in debt that they, they sent it to the King of France. I don't know. Uh, I don't get in depth on historical. It's, it's still a little soupy. But the latest thinking is that the Crusaders or the Knights Templars uh, probably did not keep it. And um, it was sent from the Byzantine throne to the French throne, but no one knows for sure. Okay, thank you. If you have questions, please feel free to post them. We still have a few minutes. Um, but here's another one um, that I have here from Tom Sheehan. There was some bishop circa 1350 or so who wrote a letter saying that this was definitely not the original burial cloth of Jesus, but a more recent painting. For a long time, that was very influential in the controversy over the authenticity of the shroud. 
What's the current status of that negative appraisal? Tom, are you referring to uh, the Darsus Memorandum? I, I think so, yes. It was um, Bishop of some place or other, uh, circa 1350-ish or so. Um, in, in, in 1389, uh, Bishop Darsus issues a, a memorandum. They're not even sure it made it to the Avignon Pope, but he claims that his predecessor uh, 30 some years previously, uh, name, um, I think his name was Henry de Poiters, um, conducted an investigation of this and the forger confessed to having painted the shroud. Um, there's no record of any type of investigation in the diocesan records or in the historians uh, of Troy's uh, and and uh, and uh, Luray, um, where where this exhibit was, um, there's no mention um, of the guy's name or his method, and and you could scientifically completely refute the shroud is not a painting. Whatever else it is, it's not a painting. They're not even sure this this memorandum even went there. All they have is a copy of what at best is a rough draft. And the assumption is made that it was there because later this Avignon Pope says, well, you can still display the shroud, but you don't, you can't say it's Jesus's burial cloth. You have to say it's a representation of it. So it's as if maybe he saw the memorandum and he's just trying to placate both sides. We really don't know, but the contents of it are demonstratively false and at best it's compounded hearsay. Um, he's saying somebody else said this in the 1350s and there's no record at all and there's not even the name of the of the painter let alone his method and plus you just you couldn't paint it today. Um, so it, it may be at the time it held sway um, but science um, says it's not true. Okay. Um, does anybody have more questions? And if you want to, you can post them. We're getting close to the end. I'll ask one more question that was posed by Tom Sheehan. Very, uh, modern, very precise infrared spectroscopic techniques were not available in the 1980s. What additional information do you expect to get from new measurements using such instruments? If, if the infrared, visible, and ultraviolet spectrums are examining every inch of the shroud and all the materials on them, and, and between the threads, God only knows how much information you're going to get. But you could, and you could identify things like if you see some limestone or pollens or something, you could take them out and then put them on the, on the death size uh, molecular microscope who would look at it under all those spectrums as well. And I think you'll get a better understanding of everything you're trying to tell from the cloth as a whole, or even a fragment of a, of a material on there um, at, the micro, at the macroscopic level and the microscopic level. Um, I, I think it has a world of information and some of these tiny particles, like I said, can be examined at the subatomic level as well. and and you could just blow the roof off of, of uh, the subject. Right. Okay, well, I think we have reached the end of our question and answer, and I would like to uh, switch over to Sister Marisha for the closing. Um, let me find you here. Mark was going to offer the closing yes, prayer, and we have one more question from Paul Segura. Oh, good. Okay, yeah, one more question. 
I've heard about a computerized 3D scan of the image on the shroud that was used to create a life-size model recently. Can both of you presenters comment on that? I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure what you um, uh, what you're referring to. Uh, oh, uh, there's been lots of 3D reconstructions um, in the form of uh, a computer image and even um, statuette type of crucifix of of how the man looked when he was in the shroud. And some of them are very impressive, really. Father, do you know of these computerized 3D scans? Well, well I think so. I, I've seen a couple of them. And um, I think one of, the, one of the important things that it shows is that there is, um, and I think, I think Mark touched on this, there is a sort of three-dimensional information um, in the image on the shroud that isn't, say, present in, in an ordinary photo or, or 2D picture, right? That the, this, this method of, of scanning the image on the shroud as we have it um, through whatever computer voodoo, voodoo there is that is involved here, um, there's, there's three-dimensional data that, that, that constructs, that reconstructs a, a shape like a head or a body in 3D space that, that the same process, the same um, equipment or program doesn't, isn't able to produce from from any other two-dimensional image. Does that sound familiar, Mark? Do you know what I'm talking It's like NASA equipment or something, right? Yeah. That, that measures deep space distances and stuff like that? You, you, can, um, uh, you can manufacture a lot of times any image you want on a computer, but the trick is you want to get one that um, the subject you're examining, you find true, a true relationship between intensity and distance. And, and right, that, that's what it means. Yeah. All right, great, thank you. Um, Sister Marisha, do you have anything to say before we close with a prayer? I have to unmute, there you are. Yes, yes. Okay. Hello. Well, I want to thank you um, Mr. Antonacci, and also Father Nikolai for a fascinating presentation on the Shroud of Turin, which bears witness to Christ's crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And we from the Office of Consecrated Life, I test, and the Catholic Medical Association, thank you for joining us. We hope that this presentation on the Shroud of our Faith enriches your experience of the reality of Christ's resurrection. We also want to let you know that this webinar will be available on the websites of the three co-hosting ministries, as well as other resources and events. So please check them out. And most importantly, may our Lord bless and protect you and your families. Let us continue to pray for one another for an end to this pandemic. And we thank you until next time. Okay. So Mark, I don't know if we could close with a prayer. Okay, you stole some of my thunder. I, I uh, um, admirably you did. Um, I, I just wanted to pray that, um, um, that God, uh, watches over the scientists and doctors and helps them find, find an effective vaccine uh, for the coronavirus and every other endeavor that, they, that, that we try to do to, to help humanity. Um, and, and, and this even goes for our research on the Shroud of Turin. No matter what the results are, please help guide us to find the truth wherever that may lay. But, but more importantly, let us understand that there's there's no conflict between science um, and faith. Um, they're compatible. And let us learn that. And, and let us um, please guide us and help us, as you have your whole, um, for 2,000 years, to help us realize that the, uh, the sacrifice you made for us and the ultimate goal that we could obtain through you and through your sacrifice um, 
that that we, that we all find salvation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Until next time. God bless you. I thank you for joining us. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks for having me.